Okay, good morning. Welcome back 2023. We're going to start our free education series again that um, I do just because I like to. Uh, and I like to teach and I love people learn about their health and I love empowering people to take better care of themselves and their families. Um, I am an orthopedic surgeon in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My name is Meredith Warner, also the founder of Well Theory and also the Healing Soul. And those two companies are sort of the way that I can increase the number of people that can take care of themselves. Um, this talk is about weight loss and obesity. And really the question I get, how do I lose weight? <clears throat> and everybody knows the fundamentals that they've been taught by the, I guess, the larger societies and bodies of, oh, eat this, eat that, don't eat this, don't eat that. But nothing seems to have worked. And we're going to talk about that and then talk about some newer things and some newer techniques and a lot of neuroscience, believe it or not, that goes into this and why people can and can't or think they can and think they can't lose weight. So anyway, let's get into it. All right, again, I'm Dr. Meredith Warner. This is my clinic in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We do a lot of wellness work, but we also have a heavy focus, obviously, on orthopedic surgery and podiatry. Uh, we do a lot of surgery, but my primary emphasis is to treat things non-surgically and let people get better on their own. And believe it or not, there's an abundant amount of data out there that shows that non-surgical care for most orthopedics problems is highly effective. Um, and there's actually some placebo-controlled sham surgery studies that show this as well, too that sham surgeries or fake surgeries have the same outcomes as real surgeries in many cases. Um, anyway, we'll get into all that in other talks later, but today let's talk about weight loss and obesity because I know a lot of people in January have their new year's resolutions and uh, are embarking on this path. All right. So just what is the problem that we have? And I know somebody out there, you have personal problems, but on a societal level, we have a really big problem um, with obesity in this country and now globally. So since about the 1960s or 70s, Americans have blossomed. We have become bigger and bigger and bigger. About 60% of us, so six out of 10, are overweight or obese. Think about that. That is awful if you think about health and wellness. 88%, so almost nine out of 10 people qualify for metabolic dysfunction. Okay, so metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, those kind of diseases that, that, that then lead into things like dementia, Alzheimer's, diabetes, cancer, arthritis, um, things like that. And no diet, no plan has worked so far, obviously, because we have only gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So everything that has come before, all of the thoughts and nutrition and diets and all of the fad diets and all the plans and everything anybody's told you may or may not be true, but I can tell you at a societal level, it hasn't worked something is making us get bigger and not lose weight. <clears throat> and now obesity is our biggest export, I say. It's our American product, our gift to the world. So we have sent our fast food restaurants everywhere. We've sent our processed foods everywhere. We've sent our manufactured, nasty, disgusting meat products. And not that meat itself is bad, and we'll get into that. And all of our potato chips and our French fries and our pizza and our blah, 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 giving it to the world. And now the world is obese too. All the pills that we've tried have failed and have had bad side effects. I don't know if anybody remembers FenFen. Fen. Um, and then the surgery fails a lot too. So right now to date, and we'll talk about this briefly, our most effective tool for obesity is a surgical procedure that keeps people from eating too much. That is what has worked. Now think about that. People have to go under anesthesia and have a surgery to help them lose weight because nothing else is working. Okay, so to my knowledge, no diet has been a fail safe, uh, sustainable, consistent to help at a societal level. Now, somebody out there is going to be incensed and very angry and say something about, oh, this diet worked perfectly for me. It's the greatest diet in the world. That may be true, but I'm talking about at a global scale, at an epidemiological scale in America, we have gotten fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter, and nothing's worked to make the whole problem get better. So there are some good ideas out there and there's some science behind certain diets, such as a ketogenic diet, um, low calorie diets, caloric restriction, time restricted eating, intermittent fasting. A lot of that is coming to fruit to bear. We're going to talk about that. And I think there's a lot of good science behind most of that. Um, but I'll tell you this, it's not coming from our 
I guess our nutrition and diet industry, it's not coming from the government. None of this knowledge is coming from the food industry, obviously, or the pharmaceutical industry. It's really coming out of the anti-aging and longevity world. This is where we've learned most of these newer techniques that are really going to help people. So if it were me and I had to lose weight, I would not depend on the food industry to tell me how to lose weight would not depend on the government regulators. I certainly wouldn't depend on big pharma, although there are some new drugs out that are extremely successful so far. And we're going to talk about those because I know a lot of people are very interested in those. Um, and the number one thing I can impart to you is this. <clears throat> Being obese and overweight is not the problem in and of itself. Generally speaking, that is a side effect of a metabolic dysfunction. Okay. So most people are sick before they are obese, if that makes sense. So most people have cellular dysfunction and mitochondrial failure and have already started on the pathway to the metabolic problems before they show the outward manifestation of obesity. And there are plenty of people out there who are so-called skinny fat, and there are plenty of people out there who are skinny and thin, but also have metabolic dysfunction, believe it or not, insulin resistance and whatnot. And that has to depend on different things. So for instance, people of Asian descent tend to put more um, fat around the liver and the organs before they put it externally. And then people of African descent, uh, descent do the opposite. It's more external. So like quote unquote healthier fat before it gets packed around the internal organs, which is your unhealthy fat, uh, which of course leads to an increased waist circumference, which is one of the signs of metabolic dysfunction. So there's a lot of little nuances, but I'm just gonna give you sort of general information. So you need to think about what is your source of metabolic dysfunction and really address that because who cares about the obesity and the overweight? It's not about looks or anything like that. It's really about the fundamental nature of your cellular function. And are you going to get cancer? Are you going to get diabetes? Are you going to get dementia? So you got to fix the source of the problem. And the other thing will take care of itself, the overweight and obesity, once you address the metabolic dysfunction. <clears throat> All right. So some people out there might be wondering, well, She's an orthopedic surgeon. What does she care about wellness and metabolic dysfunction and overweight and obesity? I'm going to tell you for the fundamental reason is obesity carries not only a higher risk of getting arthritis, tendonitis, stiffness, muscle pain, sarcopenia, uh, bone problems, uh, but obesity also carries a higher risk of infection. So we know in our world that if we can optimize people for surgery, meaning make them lose weight, they have better outcomes and lower risk of infection. I don't know if you know this, but in some major systems, big hospital systems that are tied in with uh, the big payers, uh, physicians and hospitals are paid on outcomes. And so in a subtle way, it behooves people to not operate on the morbidly obese and on the majorly obese because you know your pay is going to get cut because you know the infection risk is going to be higher. They're going to do poorly. They're going to get DVTs. They're not going to get out of bed and walk. So there's a lot of problems with surgery when you operate on people that are outside of a normal BMI, okay, body mass index, and we'll talk about that too. Higher rate of revision surgeries, particularly in the total joint world, which total knees is probably the most common orthopedic surgery done, if not the most common surgery done after like hernia surgery, I think. Uh, infection, blood loss, deep vein thrombosis or blood clots, big problem if you're obese. Obesity is a known risk factor for that. Increased cost of surgery. It takes extra retractors. You have to have extra assistance in there. You got to have call in like six or seven people to move someone from a gurney to the bed and then back from the bed to the gurney. You have to pay for all of these things that sit on the side of the table that keep a larger person from falling off the table. So there's a lot that goes into operating on the obese and the overweight that most people don't know about that increase the cost. There is a poor outcome from rehab and poor ability to engage in rehab. And then they don't heal as fast because why? Not because they're overweight, but because there's metabolic dysfunction and the immune system is not working properly. And most obese are actually malnourished when it comes to micronutrients and uh, the things that matter. And then, of course, there's more pain. So that in a nutshell is why ortho cares. Why do I care? I care about my patients and their wellness. And I have learned over the years that most of what we orthopedic surgeons focus on is not really addressing any of the true source of the problem. We're essentially just slapping band-aids on things. So somebody might come in with arthritis and we say, oh, well, let's just remove that arthritic joint and replace it with a metal and plastic sandwich. You know, good job. 
However, nobody has ever addressed why is the cartilage failing? What is going on here? Why is this person stiff? Why do they have tendonitis? Why is their Achilles tendon so thick? What happened to that uh, joint where the medial side is contracted but the lateral side is open? Nobody cares about that. They just see the big problem and say, oh, I'm gonna fix that x-ray and make that x-ray pretty. So over the years, I've learned that what is making my world you know, have jobs to do and have surgical procedures to do is the same thing that is giving the cancer doctor's business, that is giving the mental health doctor's business, that is giving the neurodegenerative doctors that treat Alzheimer's and Parkinson's business. It's the same thing. It's mitochondrial failure, metabolic dysfunction, oxidative stress, chronic inflammation. So all of these subsystem problems at the cellular level, microscopic level, lead to not just breakdown of the brain and the heart and atherosclerosis, things like that, but it's also leading to breakdown of tendons, ligaments, bones, cartilage, muscle. And so I have started to develop protocols and plans to treat the fundamental core problem. One of these is weight loss, but again, not just for the weight loss thing, but to address the metabolic dysfunction. So I try to get people to stop eating sugar, stop having added sugar, work on things to get their numbers better. So get the lipid profiles better, get the uh, sugar profile better, maybe start taking NAD to pump up the energetics or the bioenergetics of their cells, things like that, or NMN really, which is the precursor. They're really the only way orally you can bump up your NAD. <clears throat> so I've realized that surgery is just fixing a symptom, just like a steroid injection, right? Yeah, I can make you feel better for a couple of weeks, maybe, but at what cost and what am I doing long-term? So I think that we need to treat the fundamental problems first. And I'm interested in lifetime improvements for my patients to make them have better lives, be more productive, have more fun with their grandkids and really enjoy the golden years, right? We work our whole lives, we pay taxes for what reason, I'm not sure. Uh, and then you get retired and what, what happens when you're tired? You, you could barely lift your leg up to cross your leg. It's hard to get out of bed, your feet hurt, your neck hurts, you're having trouble seeing, you're having trouble hearing. And it's like, it's just not fair. So I think that we can fight all that. We don't have to practice ageism. I certainly don't. And so this is the fundamental reason why, why, why I, I care about obesity, because I want to fix the fundamental problems that lead to all those side effects. <clears throat> all right. So what is body mass index? So this is just a sort of standard way that we assess if people um, have excess adipose accumulation, I guess would be the best way to say it. So it's your weight in kilograms divided by the square of your height, okay? It's not the greatest method um, because some people who are heavily muscled will have a higher BMI, okay? Um, but it's, it's it, in terms of crude methodologies, it's really all we have because you're not gonna be able to put people in water tanks or like do big bioenergetic testing to check out their true lean mass to, um, fat mass ratios. Now you can do DEXA scans for this and whatnot, but I guarantee you no insurance company is going to pay for that. So this is obviously the cheapest thing we have. Therefore it's covered by insurance companies. So we can use this. So for instance, the surgery center where I operate in Baton Rouge uh, won't let us operate on anybody that has a BMI over 50. And I will tell you, obese is 30. So there's, this is where it comes into play. So when you're at 50, your risk is so high that you might have a complication that you can't do it in a surgery center. You have to do it in a hospital. Um, and so we also know that certain risk factors for like diabetes go up as the BMI elevates for cancer goes up, et cetera, et cetera. So that's body mass index. Let's talk about macronutrients. You've heard of these. You've heard, you've all heard of these. Okay. They started becoming more popularized after they were discovered, I think in the I don't know, somewhere in the 1900s, we're going to talk about that. Carbohydrates, fats, protein, okay? And the other big macronutrient is water. So carbohydrates, you have heard about low carb, no carb, net carb, fats, good fats, bad fats, and protein, okay? And everybody, there's a lot of obsession out there about proteins. And then we're going to talk about different strategies for weight loss, which is why you're watching this webinar. I mean, I'm sure you don't want to learn about BMI. Caloric restriction, bariatric surgery, pharmacotherapy or drugs, genetic assessment, which is being done now, believe it or not, endocrine workups, which is hormonal workups. And then we're going to talk about time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, and I'll mention briefly things like the ketogenic diet. And then hopefully you guys will have some questions and hopefully I can answer them. Okay. So the macronutrients. So in 1770, 
metabolism was discovered. So what is metabolism? It's just the conversion of food and oxygen into heat and water, or eventually ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate is the molecule that stores the energy with phosphate bonds. Okay, I don't know if you guys remember your high school chemistry, but when one molecule bonds to another, it takes energy and, and you store energy that way. Okay, it's like a battery. And then when you break the bond, you release the energy. So ATP is our body's currency or the way that it easily transports energy around and utilizes it. So that is the cellular source of energy for most, most things. Of course, it's not universal, but it's most things. Yes, yeah, so we discovered that. So think about this. We evolved on a planet that has oxygen and a lot of water and sunlight. So of course, everything works that way, right? Like there's going to be oxygen water and then eventually carbon gets into the mix so we convert food glucose and oxygen into heat and water and we make atp in the early 1800s carbon nitrogen hydrogen oxygen these are all recognized as primary food components carbon okay is like goes into fats the double bonds and things like that nitrogen is your primary amino acid component and then um, obviously we know about water. 1827, Dr. William Prout recognized that fat is actually an important macronutrient nutrient, along with the proteins and the carbs. So I guess up until this point, everybody just thought fat was fat and it wasn't a big deal. Nobody really knew what it was for. But now we know that it is actually important. You actually need a ton of it for your brain. Um, and this is when the, the, the world of nutrition really started. And remember, this is well before anybody knew anything about vitamins or micronutrients or, you know, sulfurophane from broccoli or anything like that. The first vitamin wasn't even isolated until 1926. Now think about this. This means that the whole concept of nutrition and food science is very, very young. So obviously every year when you know the body of knowledge doubles every hour now um, and nutrition science really started in the mid 1900s, obviously we're going to be learning more and more and more now and things are going to change very rapidly. So like whatever I'm giving you today in this talk, if I give the same talk next year, it might be completely different. And I probably will because I like to stay updated and I like to keep you updated. So, and this is a picture of a fatty liver. So if you see those little circles, those globules, that is a liver that has been packed with fat. So that is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is massively um, epidemic now in this country. It used to people people it used to be that people would only get that if they had a raging case of hepatitis C or they were a raging alcoholic or had diabetes for years and years and years. We see this now in kids. And it has to do with excess energy. Next. So the macronutrients, macro means big. So these are the nutrients that we believe are required in large amounts, okay? Water obviously required in large amounts zero calories per gram. And we're going to talk about calories briefly. There's a lot of controversy even about counting calories. Uh, protein is, a, we think, about four calories per gram. Carbohydrates, about four calories per gram. Fats, about nine. I think alcohol is somewhere around seven, if I'm not mistaken. So here's your, your little um, nutrition label about bunny bread. And some of you may be watching a different part of the country, and that would be like Wonder Bread. So one slice is 25 grams of carbs, okay? And so that would mean 25 times four because it's four calories per gram. So each slice is 100 calories, but wait, there's more. Each slice apparently has four grams of protein. And remember, gluten is wheat's primary source of protein. And then there's a little bit of fat in each slice. So it ends up adding to about 130. All of this label, it, labeling is very heavily regulated and monitored by our government uh, partners. OK, now, interestingly, the way you check a glycemic index, you probably have all heard of that, is by how much your glucose spikes after eating a slice of white bread. So that tells you something. This kind of refined white bread product is essentially sugar. You're essentially eating spoonfuls of sugar. OK, so not not a good product to eat if you're trying to lose weight. So I've actually had conversations with patients where I. I'm a big believer in making tiny habits, small incremental changes. And then as that becomes normal for you, add another tiny habit, another incremental change. The first thing I try to get people to do is cut out red coats or full sugar soda, and then to cut out bunny bread if they can do it or wonder bread. So if you could just cut those two things out of your life, you're saving yourself a lot of grief and then you'll start feeling better, be more motivated to make the next changes, so on and so forth. All right. So that's macronutrients. 
put it out to just pick one of those two brands. All of them are identical. Oh, yeah. I'm not. I'm supposed to be brand agnostic. All refined white bread is not good. Okay. All right. So just the calorie controversy. Our data could potentially be wrong. This picture cut off a bit, but this is what's called a bomb calorimeter. Okay. So basically somebody invented this machine. There's some water, there's a temperature gauge, there's a little mixer. And then you, you put the food in this vessel inside the water and you basically blow it up. Um, and then you measure how much the heat changes. So remember a calorie, or maybe you don't remember this. So a calorie is merely the energy that is required to increase the temperature of one milliliter of water, one degree Celsius. Okay. One kilocalorie. So all your food is measured in kilocalories, FYI. So every time you see a calorie, it's really a thousand calories. The, if that's the energy required to raise a liter. Okay. So you've all seen two liters of Coke. So it's the smaller one, the liter. So to raise that much water, one degree Celsius. So the bomb calorimeter, calorimeter measures this for each different type of food. So this is how we've gotten our caloric information or our calorie count of food. But the problem with this is our, the human body doesn't work like a bomb calorimeter, okay? There are different processes of digestion. Some of your food goes to the gut biome and gets eaten, about 30% of high fiber foods. And so that means only 60% or 66% is getting into you. There's the thermogenic effects of food. So it takes a lot of energy to break apart a protein molecule. Um, and you end up actually burning calories to get the calories out of protein. So there's a lot of different little nuances that go into human metabolism. So straight calorie counting is not always um, efficacious, if you will, for weight loss. Um, personally, I believe the quality and the timing of your food intake is far more important than the number of calories. Um, and we're going to get into that. So that's where all this comes from, okay? Macronutrients, nutrition science, calories. So what makes you gain weight? So turns out we've learned over the years, it's not really what you eat. Um, I'm sorry, it is what you eat, not how much you eat. So in other words, if I said to you, let's have a contest, you eat 2000 calories of Snicker bars every day, and I'm gonna eat 2000 calories of sweet potatoes every day. We'll do that for two weeks. Who do you think would gain weight? Probably not me. It would be the one eating the Snickers bars, right? Even though it's the same number of calories. So that simple illustration should tell you that it's the quality and the type of the food that you're eating, not so much the calorie count that matters. Um, and by the way, I would be eating a lot more food and feel better because a thousand calories of sweet potatoes is way bigger than a thousand calories of Snickers bars. Um, what happened? Sorry. Okay. So here, and, and actually there's a lot of studies to sort of prove what I just said. So in this one, there's 120,000 subjects and subject is a word we use for people that engage in studies. Um, they followed them for 20 years and they found that weight gain is associated with the increased consumption of lower quality foods. No surprise there, right? If you're eating good, healthy, organic, whole foods, following the Mediterranean diet, you're probably not gonna get overweight or obese or have metabolic dysfunction. And that too is backed up by reams of data. If you're living your life on potato chips, crackers, white potatoes with a lot of butter on them, sugar sweetened beverages, which is the primary culprit, um, sugar sweetened snacks, adding sugar to your coffee every morning, sugar filled yogurts, highly processed red meats. If that's your diet, which I will tell you is the majority of Americans, um, then you're gonna have problems, which guess what? The majority of Americans, as I've already told you, about 90% of us have metabolic dysfunction because that's all you can find in the grocery store, am I right? So this, in my opinion, is kind of being foisted upon us. This is all that the industry is producing. They know how to produce it well. They know how to produce it fast and cheap, but that involves destroying the food, which basically destroys us. Okay. So ultra processed foods, this is what I'm talking about. So think about it this way. If a food can only exist because it has been made in a factory, it's probably ultra processed. So unless you tell me that you can go out and find a Cheeto tree and pick the Cheetos off the tree, I'm gonna tell you that it's probably ultra processed. Now, I made some muesli this morning. Muesli is rolled oats, raisins, almonds, whatever, high fiber. I added some flax meal to make it even more high fiber. Um, but all of that I can find in nature. I can pick an oat 
I can pick a grape and dry it and make a raisin. I can find an almond on a tree. <coughs> so that is not ultra processed. Now, because I did buy it at a store, it's probably been processed in some way to make it sellable and you know put into a plastic bag, which is also a sign of processing. So I don't think you're ever going to get away from processing and you shouldn't because processing has saved us a lot of grief. It prevents cholera, prevents salmonella. So a lot of processing actually makes the food safe to eat and transport. It's the ultra processing that we really want to avoid. Okay. In this study, they put 20 adults and kept them in a hospital. Now who volunteers for this kind of study is beyond me because I wouldn't, uh, I would be bored out of my mind. But anyway, 20 adults are in a hospital stuck there for two weeks. They were split in half. So two groups, each group was fed the same um, number of macronutrients, so the same grams of carbs, the same grams of protein, the same grams of fat. Um, but in one group, they were given only ultra processed foods. So that list I just showed you of poor quality food. The other group was given whole natural foods, like you would eat on a Mediterranean style diet. At the end of the study, they realized that even though net net they were eating the same number of macronutrients, that the ultra processed group ended up eating about 500 kilocalories more each day. And then the body weight change was correlated with that difference, obviously. So, and by the way, they were allowed to eat as much as they wanted at all times of day, there were no restrictions. So what I'm showing you here, the red line is the unprocessed whole food, natural food group. The blue line is the ultra processed. And that is just a two week study where they gained about a kilogram, which is almost three pounds. Um, you can eat anything you want if it's normal, healthy, natural food, and you're probably going to be okay. Now, somebody out there is going to just, their mind's going to blow and they're going to be so upset that I just said that. What I'm trying to tell you is you got to stay away from the, un, you got to stay away from the ultra processed foods. That is the quickest way to achieve metabolic dysfunction, dementia, cancer, diabetes, et cetera. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So remember I told you before that the obese and the overweight are often actually malnourished, which of course leads to immune dysfunction, higher risk of infection, things like diabetes, whatever. Um, we know this because it's been studied and we've shown it. So there's serum or blood markers that we look at to tell us if somebody is competent nutritionally, that they're able to heal a wound, that they're able to fight an illness, okay? And one of them is albumin, which is a protein. And then one of them is lymphocytes, which is a type of white blood cell, and then transferrin, which is an, um, an iron transporter. So if these are knocked down below certain levels, we know people have a chance of doing poorly in surgery and fighting off illness. And unfortunately, in the morbidly obese and the obese population, often this is the case, believe it or not. Why? Because most of them are eating very poor quality food with no micronutrient profile. All right. So ultra processed foods we talked about are manufactured factory made foods. OK, they're basically deconstructed molecules that are put together to look like food. Then they add sugar, salt and fat. Why? Because you got to make it palatable, hyper palatable. You got to make it craveable. You want people coming back and buying more and more and more. So you add sugar because, you know, that triggers things in the gut and the brain that induce craving and give people dopamine hits and make them want more and more and more. You add fat because obviously that makes it very tasty and yummy. And then you add salt for the same reason, because salt triggers certain things in our brain that make us want more. Uh, so basically all of these food, these poor quality, highly processed, ultra processed snack foods and whatever um, are engineered to be addictive. Why? Because it increases shareholder value. It increases sales. It keeps that product going off the shelves and uh, people make money. So basically everybody's making money off of you by giving you metabolic dysfunction, which is kind of sad, but that's the world we live in. I'm telling you about it because that's the only way it's going to change. It's not changing from the industry level. It's not going to change from pharmaceutical level. It's certainly not going to change from the government level. You have to make the change because no one else is going to do it for you. Um, there's just no way people have been knowing this for forever. You know, I don't know if anybody out there saw that great movie, um, super size me, but that was put out in what 2004 and nothing's changed. There's more McDonald's than ever. All right. So ultra processed foods are manufactured, engineered for addiction and filled with what are called advanced glycation end products. What is that? Advanced glycation end products are a marker of aging. So the diabetics have more of them and make them faster. They have accelerated aging. Basically, what happens is excess glucose in your bloodstream bonds to the free ends of amino acids and forms what I call a monster protein, which gloms up the function of everything else. 
So it changes how your cells receptors work, changes how the ion channels work, changes how the DNA works. It'll get into your tendons and make your tendons stiff and not move right and glide right. It'll get into your muscle, make your muscle dysfunction. Guess where it really loves to get into is cartilage, synovial tissue and destroy joints. So when you are hyperglycemic, you're forming ages all the time. I'm forming these right now. Um, even the euglycemic or normal blood glucose level people are. The key is to keep your formation to a minimum to slow down your aging, which is what I try to do for myself and my family and my patients. Um, unfortunately, most of these processed foods are made in high heat environments with uh, excess amino acids and glucose. And guess what? They're packing them full of these ages and then feeding them to you. And multiple studies have shown that if you ingest an advanced glycation end product, it's ending up in your body and it's going to go somewhere. <laughs> Usually the lens, this is why a lot of people get cataracts and why diabetics have eye problems sooner. It goes to the tendons, like the Achilles tendon, it goes to cartilage. And then it also damaged the endothelial sit lining of blood vessels and it contribute to atherosclerosis, it makes your muscles function poorly. So again, obesity is a side effect, right? Weight gain is a side effect. The real problem is what's going on at the cellular level. All right, so let's talk about exercise as a weight loss strategy. A lot of times when I'm talking to patients, they tell me they can't lose weight only because their knees hurt or their feet hurt and they just can't exercise enough. And that's really what's holding them back. Well, unfortunately, that is kind of a myth. And I need to break that myth because you do need to exercise because it's amazingly good for your brain, your bone and your muscle health. OK, and it does a lot of other things that will uh, help with metabolic dysfunction. So exercise is mandatory for a long, productive, good life, but it is not going to help you lose weight. OK, so do it for your brain, do it for longevity, do it to be stronger, do it to be able to play with your grandkids. But I wouldn't rely on exercise as a weight loss strategy. A single bag of potato chips or a protein bar, my personal favorite, the exercise bars, one of those will negate about three hours of exercise for you. So you can exercise till the cows come home. But if you're eating poor quality foods, it's almost irrelevant. And there's other reasons exercise doesn't help lose weight. Next slide. Oh, yeah. If you have somebody that needs help with weight loss, share this, um, because I think it's important for everybody to know everything um, and not just what they're seeing on the Internet. OK, which although this is on the Internet, so that was kind of ironic. So don't sweat exercise. That's what I'm saying. So this is a picture of a Hadza person. This is one of the members of a hunter gatherer tribe in Africa. OK, they still exist and they're still living the same way they lived years and years ago, literally hunting and gathering food every day on a daily basis. OK, they have studied the calorie burning of this population and compared it to the calorie burning of an office worker in Illinois, believe it or not. Um, and we burn the same number of calories. Even though the hot cell walk 10,000 at least, usually 16,000 steps a day if they don't run it. Okay, think about that. They're doing that every day, their whole lives. They're burning the same number of calories as a sedentary office worker in Illinois. Pregnant women don't burn more calories than regular people either. I hate to break that myth as well. And then this Dr. Herman Potzer, he worked out how many calories our 37 trillion cell organisms might need. And remember, your gut biome has another 100 trillion organisms. You have to feed the gut too. That's why fiber is so important. And basically found out that over time, net, net, no matter what your activity level, we adapt and end up burning relatively the same number of calories. So regression to the mean. Okay. The basal metabolic rate is what you're burning just sitting here or just sitting thinking or reading a book. If you're not expending excess energy by exercising, that's about 60 to 70% of your daily calories. And 20% of that is brain so your brain takes a vast majority of your energy because it's very glucose hungry and it's always working, obviously. Um, but your basal metabolic rate will adapt and certain features of your metabolism will be downgraded to make up for the exercise. So you'll end up burning the same number of calories. But again, I'm not saying don't exercise. You absolutely need to exercise. It's extremely healthy for a number of reasons, primarily for brain health. Um, but if you're out there thinking that you're never going to lose weight because you can't exercise, I have to dispel you of that myth. You actually have the power within yourself to lose weight, even if you can't exercise. All right, so how do they figure this out? With double labeled water. So basically they put distinct isotopes or little markers 
on the hydrogen and oxygen molecules in a, in a bottle of water. And they had people drink this instead of regular water. Then they take the urine that you pee out and they basically can figure out how much of the label oxygen was breathed out as CO2, which is a byproduct of forming ATP that we talked about before. They do this ratio of the oxygen in the urine to figure out how much was burned off and they can effectively figure out what your real metabolic rate is just with this double label, labeled water technique, which has really only been around for, you know, not that long, maybe like a couple decades at most. And it's only starting to permeating most of the nutrition literature now. Um, and it's very expensive to do this. So most of the studies don't do this. So a lot of the studies are just guessing on calories, but the double la labeled water studies do show that our energy expenditure equilibrates and adapts over time. And then we were also able to look at our metabolism versus like monkeys and chimpanzees and elephants and stuff and figure things out about species metabolism. All right. And then, so we have found that humans, we burn about 20% more per day than chimps and bonobos. Okay. Different types of primates. We burn about 40% more per day. And this is pound for pound uh, than gorillas. And we burn 60% more calories pound for pound than orangutans. A lot of people think it's because of our brain that we're burning this much more energy. Um, but again, that's still being looked at and studied. Humans have more fat than other mammals as well. Males about two times as much fat as, as a gorilla or an orangutan, similar size. Females about three times as much. And look at the different sizes of brains and the neuron count in different creatures. So we're at about 16 billion neurons versus the next closest is the Western gorilla at nine. Um, so obviously our brains take up a lot of our basal metabolic rate and uh, that's where a lot of your energy goes. All right, so remember the Hatsa, they're walking more in a day than we do in a week, generally speaking. Uh, but they only burn the same amount of energy daily that we do. So we're burning the same number of calories, even though they're walking more in a day than we do in a week. So try to wrap your head around that one. And this has been studied in different populations. So you can't just say, oh, you know, that's only applying to Illinois office workers. No, this is true for Europeans, Japanese, Russians. They've looked at it all. We end up all in about the same rate. Female farmers in Africa use about 2,400 kilocalories a day. Office workers in Chicago use about 2,400 kilocalories a day. I will say that as you get older, you do tend to use fewer calories. And that may be because of the sarcopenia associated with uh, being older or the muscle loss. All right. So again, just to reiterate, you will adapt to your activity levels. Uh, you, you will find that less energy goes into things like the stress response system of your cellular function, less um, inflammation, your immune system might get depressed, like different things will happen to equilibrate you. But net, at the end of the day, you're going to end up burning the same number of calories. Um, but again, exercise is essential for good brain health. Nobody's saying don't exercise. You absolutely should, especially if you're interested in a good, long, healthy life. And if you want to enjoy your goal or your golden years, you have to exercise. Otherwise, you're just going to be at the mercy of everyone. People like me, the hospitals, the home health industry. We don't want that. I want you to be able to take care of yourself till the last minute. Um, they studied sedentary women. So women that don't do anything, basically office workers that don't exercise. And they had them train for a marathon. And they found that after about the first week of training where they did expend a bit more energy than they took in, they ended up burning the same number of calories pre-training as during training for a marathon. And I don't know if anybody out there has trained for a marathon, but you have to run upwards of 20, 30 miles a day, not a day, but periodically, but you're running a lot. Um, and then to know that you're burning the same number of calories overall as when you weren't training at all could be disheartening, but think about the brain health and just feeling good, the stress reduction, the mood elevation, the reduction of depression and anxiety, getting your muscles stronger, getting your tendons stronger, generally being able to perform better. So the benefits of exercise should always be talked about, but it's not for weight loss. And this is a quote, not from me, from a Dr. John, John Speakman, who said, you cannot exercise your way out of obesity. That is one of the zombie ideas that refuses to die. So I don't want you to have the mindset that just because you can't exercise that you can't lose weight because obviously it's not true. Um, Kelly just made a comment. She was enjoying it. She's trying to lose weight so she can get her knees fixed and have a better life. All right. Uh, we just had a comment from a Kelly who is trying to lose weight so she can get her knees fixed so that she can have a better and improved life. 
it sounds like your physician wants you to lose weight before they're before they will perform the surgery, uh, which is good. That's optimizing your outcomes. And you know why now um, you saw the picture of the infected need. You don't want to be that person. So the more weight loss you can have happen, the better your outcomes are be, will be. And in some cases, you may end up feeling so good, you might not even need the surgery. All right, so weight loss strategies. Here's an old one that maybe you may remember or not remember. They used to actually wire people's jaws shut. Why? to stop them from eating. So, you know, they'd sip a straw and drink some kind of nutrition shake periodically, but jaw wiring was a thing. Now, in some cases, jaw wiring is done to, to protect the mandible after fractures and whatnot. But I remember, um, I think it was on MTV, you know, back when MTV was a thing, somebody on one of their shows had their jaw wired shut to lose weight. Like that's a little extreme. Nobody really does that now, but I'm just giving you all the information on the crazy stuff that's been done. So we're going to go through these quickly. Well, not quickly. We're going to go through these now. All right. Caloric restriction. So usually this fails. We know this. How do we know this? Because every diet has failed in the United States of America. 60% of us are overweight or obese, 90% of metabolic dysfunction. So caloric restriction, although you would think if you eat less than you expend, you would lose weight. Sure. But usually it's never sustainable um, and nobody can keep it up and they gain all the weight back. Um, it is the most common method, of course, that is prescribed and recommended by nutritionists and dietitians. The goal being to decrease the calories that you take in to be lower than the number that you burn with your basal metabolic rate every day. Now, if you go on a starvation diet, will you eventually lose weight? Yes, of course you will. And this is a well-known method of torture in war and things like that. So caloric restriction, you will lose weight. The problem is the sustainability and all the other problems that come with it. Now I'll tell you what we've learned and the reason I have the pictures of these Reese's monkeys here is because caloric restriction uh, is shown to actually extend your lifespan. So some caloric restriction is actually probably good and we should all engage in it no matter what. So about usually we try to get people down to 12 to 1800 kilocalories a day for caloric restriction. Remember I told you the normal intake is about 2400. So 2400 to 12 or 1800, that's going to be that gap, that margin is going to be your caloric restriction. These macronutrient things are the typical recommendations from the dietitians and nutritionists. You want 50 to 55% carbs, you want 15 to 25% protein, you only want 30% fat. Um, you know, it's really hard to manage all of that and like figure out what your macronutrient input output is. Um, these are just general standard guidelines. And of course, as we know, they haven't really worked at a societal level. But I will tell you that if you can caloric restrict, you will live longer. Um, but you can do this through fasting, intermittent fasting, and fasting mimicking diets too. So there's a lot of tricks. All this data is being looked at right now on more and more humans. But certainly in um, lower organisms like worms, Drosophila flies, higher organisms like mice and rats, and then primates, we know that caloric restriction makes them healthier, more active, perform better, have less mental problems, happier, and then they live longer and they're stronger. So I'm going to say that probably what we think we should be eating is not really what we should be eating. Bridget had a comment. Okay. We have a comment. Hold on. I can put it on the screen so I can see, but um, she wants to get rid of that extra weight to relieve her foot pain, but she says she has some bad exercise and because her foot hurts. She's open to all the answers to help lose some weight. Okay, so Bridget sounds familiar to me. She's got foot pain, um, which I see all the time because my subspecialty is foot and ankle surgery. And she says that's why she hasn't been able to exercise and she's nervous that that's maybe why she hasn't lost weight. But I want Bridget to know there are ways to lose weight without exercising. And that's what we're going to talk about. One of the ways is caloric restriction. Hard to do, hard to sustain, hard to keep going. But if you can restrict your calories a bit, know that you're helping your brain out and you're going to live longer. One of the easiest tricks to do is what the Okinawans do. Um, and that is whenever you get served a food and a plate at a meal, you, they usually leave about 20% of it on the plate by culture and tradition. But that in and of itself is caloric restriction of about 20%. So every time you get served food, if you just leave a little bit on the plate and don't get seconds, you're automatically restricting your calories. Now that doesn't mean take take 20% more when you serve yourself, take your normal size and then just leave some on the plate. That's an easy trick. Which is hard for that generation because they were told not to wait. Yeah, that's hard for the generation like my mom's generation because they will not waste anything. Um, 
So that, you know, I grew up eating two week old leftovers. I still have a tendency to do that because of that sort of being taught not to waste anything, not to throw anything away. But I'm going to tell you, you'll be saving the planet and saving yourself if you don't eat that 20% because the money, the energy and the waste produced in a single ICU stay is massive. So you can avoid that one heart attack or stroke then all of that food you may or may not have thrown away is going to become irrelevant in terms of the net net energy cost. That's an aside. That's a whole other talk. Right. Next. Uh, no. Not Jennifer, next. Jennifer's confused. We should or shouldn't restrict calories. Calorie restriction not good for losing weight, but good for longevity. She's confused. Okay. Somebody's confused about caloric restriction. We should or should not do it. So if you are interested in longevity and living a really long time, all of the data seems to show calorie restriction does that. However, one way you can do it, which achieves the same goals of calorie restriction, because all the calorie restriction is doing is it's telling your cells that, wait, this is a stressful situation, and they go into maintenance, repair, restoration mode. So you're basically inducing what's called the stress response system at your cell level, and what happens is old, dead, misfolded proteins are cleaned up and recycled. Dead, useless mitochondria are cleaned up, new mitochondria are made. DNA mutations are cleaned up, cell membranes are repaired. All of that happens only when the system is overly stressed. And that's why caloric restriction is so useful. But you can achieve a similar response with time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. And then also that's one of the benefits of exercise because it's a stress on the system. So yes, caloric restriction will help you lose weight, but I'm going to tell you it's not sustainable. It's hard to do unless it becomes a mindset and a lifestyle where you're only eating what you should be eating, right? Not eating what will allow the abundance of excess energy to remain on your body. Um, now, one way you can kickstart a weight loss program is a very low calorie initial diet and then get back into a normal diet. And that's how all those elimination diets work. Because obviously, if you're eliminating everything, that's caloric restriction, you're going to lose weight in that initial process. And then as you add foods back, that in theory is going to make the diet more sustainable. Um, but I'll tell you, just a little bit of caloric restriction will help you live longer because you're inducing the stress response system. It will also help you lose weight. And this is why it's confusing. But most people can't keep it up. Most people aren't going to stay at 1,200 to 1,800 kilocalories a day. And then guess what else happens? Your body's going to adapt to caloric restriction and you're going to, your basal metabolic rate will probably drop. This has been seen in starvation studies, uh, which were done years and years ago. All right. I don't know if that cleared it up, but maybe keep following me and I'm going to give you some other tricks that help with the caloric restriction, but aren't as difficult to do, but also promote longevity. Two comments. We'll go back to. All right, we got two comments. We heard you. We're going to come back to them. So this was a 20 year long study of these rhesus monkeys. One group was fed the normal diet that they normally feed these lab animals. One group was fed 30% fewer calories every day. And then what they found over 20 years, okay, so and some of these monkeys are still alive. So the verdict's out. Um, but look at this, <laughs> look at the graph. And then what they found was the caloric restriction group had less cancer, less diabetes, less heart disease, less brain atrophy, meaning the brains did not shrink, and more lean muscle. The caloric restriction extends the life and made life, made life better for these monkeys. It's done it for mice and rats, and it's doing it for people. Now, one trick is resveratrol, which one of the wealthier products is resveratrol because it's now known as a longevity molecule. Uh, resveratrol has been shown to actually mimic the effects of caloric restriction on the mitochondria. So I take resveratrol every day in the morning, full disclosure for you guys, but I'm not taking it for weight loss. I'm taking it for longevity and brain health and the antioxidants effects of it. But that is one of the molecules, the so-called longevity molecules that helps your cells begin to mimic the effects of caloric restriction. It shouldn't replace caloric restriction, but maybe we don't have to restrict as much, or maybe we can do it in other ways like time restricted eating or intermittent fasting to get that um, brain health and longevity benefit. Okay, but if you look at the lifespan, so the green is non-caloric restriction, and then there's 25%, 55%, 65% caloric restriction. And you just see as they get older on the x-axis, um, and then how many have survived. So up to about, it looks like 60, everybody survived, and then it just drops off. The non-caloric restricted group starts to die much earlier than the 25% restricted group who live 
a good bit longer, it looks like. And then the 55% live even longer, doesn't seem to be any added benefit at 65%. So maybe the ad libitum or, or when you let a lab animal eat whatever they want, whenever they want. So kind of like humans in America, we can eat whatever we want, whenever we want. There's nothing restricting us except our own brains. Um, maybe what we normally want is way too much is what I'm saying. So this is going to get into mindset and telling your brain to think different ways. And we're going to talk about that. But I think in America, we just have too much all the time. That's too easy to get. I mean, I can get my groceries delivered now like this, anything delivered anytime I want any ultra processed food. It's there. It's easy. It's cheap, even with inflation, relatively speaking. Um, and that's the problem. We have a relative abundance. We are unable to engage in caloric restriction unless we trick our, our trick our brains, unless we use our brains to help ourselves. All right. So the goal of caloric restriction. So when you go see a dietitian or nutritionist or you go to some weight loss seminar or whatever, they're always going to tell you the goal is five to 15 percent body weight loss, assuming your BMI is 30 or whatever, right? Why? Because that's when you start seeing the health benefits. So we don't start seeing any metabolic dysfunction benefits or health benefits. So about 5%, 10% is usually when we see a lot and 15%, you're going to get a, lot, a, a bunch of them. So a lot of diabetic people that lose weight end up not taking their blood pressure meds because they don't need them. They stop taking insulin because they don't need it. They stop taking their, you know, all of their diabetes drugs because they don't need it because they've effectively cured their metabolic dysfunction with weight loss which is really, again, the side effect of the metabolic dysfunction. So the restriction of the calories, stress the cells, get them to clean up and repair themselves. Everything starts to work better. You do lose weight as a side effect, but the real benefit is your metabolic health improves. But you have to lose about five to 15%. So generally speaking, most people will give you the advice to eat less than you need. So eat 15 to 60% less energy than you need. And I just showed you up to about 55% of your at will eating, if you eat 55% of that, you'll live the longest and have the, the most health. And then eventually what happens when you don't have all this excess energy and glucose floating around, and when you burn the glycogen that's stored in your muscle, uh, what happens is you then begin to start burning fat. So the body senses, hey, I don't have any reserves of glucose left, there's no glycogen, but the brain still got to function and I still got to move. So what does it go to? It goes to the stored energy, which is the fat. And then eventually, as you burn that fat, uh, if you, we can talk about ketones and ketogenesis later, but eventually as you burn the fat, you're going to find that the stress response system takes over, everything gets cleaned up, and then um, you have lower risk for the non-communicable diseases. So all of the metabolic dysfunction diseases like cancer, diabetes, dementia, arthritis, atherosclerosis, stroke, I mean, you name it, almost all of them are from metabolic dysfunction. The calorie study looked at 218 people. They were normal or moderately overweight. So I'm going to assume that that's BMI less than 30. Um, they calorie restricted them for two years versus a normal diet. Okay. And remember, a lot of these studies are self-report and uh, remembering what you ate and documenting it. They're not, it's not like these people are in a bubble being observed for two years. Uh, so a lot of nutrition studies are, you got to take them with a grain of salt. I think sometimes just keep that in the back of your mind because a lot of it is self-report. The calorie restrict group averaged about 12% of reduction in their daily intake of calories, so just 12%. They lost about 10% of their body mass over the two years and they got really healthy. So they lost their metabolic dysfunction. The control group lost no weight and they were more unhealthy, meaning more diagnosed conditions and they had more inflammation because in this study, they were looking at inflammatory markers. And then the group, the people that exercised preserved their bone mass and preserve their muscle mass. So that didn't really play into the weight loss except to help maybe maintain the weight loss, but calorie restriction did work in this group of people. Now, can you really keep it up for two years? Apparently they did because they lost 10% of their body mass, but a lot of us can't. And obviously America as a whole has had a problem with this. Interesting comment here. <clears throat> All right, we have a comment. Mary needs a hip replacement. Her BMI is 46, she's 71. They wanted to be 40. She's been watching and cutting out, eating good foods, but it's a slow process. But she sees it as a negative that she's lost eight pounds in five weeks. She's frustrated because she wants it faster to get surgery. Okay. That's so interesting. 
All right. Okay. So this is a lady in her early seventies who wants to get a total hip replacement, but again, the surgeons won't do it because she's over that BMI threshold that they want to make sure that they get good outcomes. Um, and she's frustrated because she's losing weight too slowly. Well, unfortunately, sometimes slow weight loss is the most effective weight loss because we know from fad diet information that the people that lose weight very, very quickly tend to gain it right back. Now, I don't know if you saw my arthritis talk before, but we've actually shown or looked at activity levels of people before and after total hip replacements. And most people actually become less active after a total hip replacement. So I don't think you can't count on your activity getting better and being able to do everything you want afterwards because most people don't. You have to be very motivated to get up and exercise and do things like that. The weight loss, if you've lost eight pounds in five weeks, is I think what I've heard, you'll probably keep that off. That sounds sustainable. Um, but keep watching. I'm going to give you some tricks that you can maybe use to accelerate and get a little bit more weight loss uh, while you're waiting for your total hip. Mindset too is like just be happy. Yeah, and I would be, I mean, that's a great weight loss. You should probably, I would be proud of myself. Uh, just keep it up. It's going to happen. All right. <clears throat> this is in dia diabetologia. I don't really know how to say that. I'm not sure why they named their journal that because it's a little too fancy in my opinion. Anyway, 2022 reviews. This is very recent data. Very low energy diets and formula meal replacement appear to be the most effective for that initial weight loss thing uh, because you end up taking in less energy than self-directed programs. Okay. So in other words, if you have one group of people that can only eat food that is mailed to them or handed to them by a dietitian, and you have another group of people that you say just eat 1200 calories a day, which group do you think is really going to eat less? Obviously this group. Problem I have with formula meals is most of that is very highly processed factory food uh, that is filled with advanced glycation end products. So I'm not a big fan of formula meal replacements, sugar shakes, all that kind of thing, like ideal protein, all that stuff, lean cuisines. That is factory food that doesn't exist in reality and offers no health benefits whatsoever except for the calorie reduction. Most of the evidence in any of our diet programs is one year or less, most of the good evidence. Um, and there is no support in the literature from this 2022 review of any macronutrient profile. So whatever you hear that you should eat this many carbs or you should eat this much protein or you should eat this much fat, you should have this ratio, whatever, there's no support in the literature for any of that, okay? There's no support for low carb, low fat, high protein, high monounsaturated fatty acid diets, vegetarian diet, low glycemic in index diets, above a control diet for weight loss. I personally recommend the Mediterranean diet to everyone that will listen to me because of all of the other health benefits of the Mediterranean diet. And also it is heavily studied. It's been studied for years and years. And we know that people that adhere to a Mediterranean diet are healthier, bar none. Um, but as we know, none of the match macronutrient profile diets have worked yet. So this study kind of just is a study that is like, duh, if America is getting bigger and there's more obesity and we've got kids with fatty liver disease and diabetes and all of our, you know, a, a vast majority, not majority, a large population is getting neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, diabetes, all these non-communicable diseases linked to metabolic dysfunction. If 90% of Americans have metabolic dysfunction, but we've been doing this diet industry for forever, well, obviously none of it works, but of course it has, you have to have a study to prove common sense. So there's your study. So nothing's really worked yet. So I think we need to change how we think about this. All right, next. So what's the evidence of the Mediterranean diet? Again, we have another 2022 review. It's relatively high in fat. So when I hear people saying you can't have fat, I disagree. I put as much extra virgin olive oil on anything that I eat as possible. I love fat, but it's extra virgin olive oil. Sometimes I'll use avocado oil. But by and large, I stick to the extra virgin olive oil if possible. Um, and I still put butter on things. I just don't eat a ton of it. Um, but it's grass finished butter. OK, and uh, it's not in excess. So this is a relatively high fat diet, a ton of omega threes out of fatty fish. OK, highly recommended in this diet. Um, and adherence to it or sticking to it is shown to lower the BMI. So people on the Mediterranean diet eat whatever they want. It's just the quality and the type and the source of the food that changes. So you don't even have to really calorie restrict if you're eating real whole natural foods 
And then I like the Mediterranean diet because of the ratio of the monounsaturated fats and the omega threes versus the omega six and the saturated fats. So it's very pro health. There's less oxidative stress that's been studied and proven less inflammation studied and proven less blood clots, better insulin sensitivity, better lipid profile, less endothelial dysfunction, which leads to atherosclerosis, stroke, et cetera, better gut microbiota. So your gut biome even gets healthier, which does what? It improves your depression and your anxiety. It improves everything. You have to have a healthy gut. The insulin resistance on the Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil, these people ended up with less central body fat. Remember, I told you that's all the fat that gets packed around the organs and inside of the liver. And they had less body fat accumulation than people on a low fat diet. Think about that. So the high fat Mediterranean diet, you end up doing better metabolically speaking than a low fat diet. Why? Do y'all remember the snack oil era when, when the dietitians and the nutritionists and the government were telling us all to eat low fat? What did the food industry do? They came back with all the low fat food products and packed them full of what? Added sugar, added salt, high fructose corn syrup, brown rice syrup, glucose syrup, whatever word for sugar they came up with. Okay. So we ended up eating a crap ton of sugar instead of olive oil. And guess what happened? America got bigger. Mary has the trend and true. What if you don't eat fish? Then how do you do the Mediterranean diet? So this is a great question Mary's asking. What if you don't eat fish? How do you possibly adhere to the Mediterranean diet? You take omega-3 supplements. Well Theory obviously has one of these because that, in my opinion, is one of the mandatory supplements of life, like D3 is. I agree. It's hard to eat fish. I'm terrible at cooking fish. It's always a disaster. I'm not the biggest fan of herring. Um, I can tell you now I have a very good friend from Russia who loves herring. Um, and then uh, what else? What's the other one that's really? Oh, sardines. I can't eat a sardine. Those are your high fat, high omega-3 fish. Or if you just eat seaweed, also a great source of um, omega-3. But if you're not going to do that and you're not good at cooking fish, and look, I'm in Louisiana, which is a land of seafood, but I'm just terrible at cooking fish. So I take omega-3s. Now, a lot of people rec recommend one gram a day or whatever. I take two to four grams every day because of the massive health benefits associated with omega-3s. And we've talked about that in other talks, particularly the one about oxidative stress and whatnot. And I actually did do a whole talk on Mediterranean diet before. But if you're not eating fish two to three times a week, you should supplement with omega-3s. Fish oil, basically. Lentils, beans, I mean... Yeah, the Mediterranean diet is a beautiful diet. It is delicious. And you, I, I guarantee, now I didn't eat like this my whole life. This has just been the past few years. I've sort of evolved with all the things I've learned. And every time I learn something, I share it with you. But I can tell you, I feel 200% better than I used to when I was a resident and eating like crap. All right. To whose kitchen? Ambitious kitchen. Oh, yeah. My, my producer and business partner, Natalie, said she loves the Ambitious Kitchen. We'll give her a shout out. Um, that uh, lady has some really good recipes of whole foods that, that would get you to adhere to this. Now, I'm coming out with a book soon um, about all of the science of how this makes you feel better and helps musculoskeletal health. Um, but it's not really a cookbook because there are so many great cookbooks out there. Now, maybe one day I'll do one, but right now I will get the Ambitious Kitchen. All right, next. All right, portions. So when we get into the strategies for weight loss, you're going to learn that at the end of the day, portion control is what works, which is effectively caloric restriction if you think about it. Um, portion sizes then, and now I found these slides online, and I, if you're interested, those are the sources. But look back in 1960 if you would go to McDonald's versus now. I mean, it's, it's scary what the food industry is doing to us. And unfortunately, we're all falling for it. We all accept it and we're okay with it. And it's just, it's unacceptable, my opinion. Think about the billionaires out there. Do you know any billionaires from the health food industry? No, but how many are in the fast food industry? We have one locally here in Louisiana, a billionaire from selling fried chicken. Uh, well, actually we should have, we have two then. Um, anyway, portion distortion, I love this slide. So 20 years ago, the um, look at the soda pop there, 85 calories, 250 nowadays. Look at the burger 20 years ago, 330 calories, which is still a lot, 590. The pizza's gotten bigger. The plates have gotten bigger. The popcorn's bigger. The muffins are bigger. Everything is bigger and bigger is not better, I hate to tell you. So when I go to restaurants, if I go to restaurants now, because when you start thinking about how they reuse their oil over and over again and they buy poor quality ingredients and 
they're effectively processing food that is also not good for you. Um, if I go to a restaurant, I find the portion size is so big, I can actually use that for the next three meals, which helps me fight the inflation. But think about that. If you're eating what like the Olive Garden is serving you in one sitting, that's enough food probably last a week for people. So the portion that the food industry is giving you is, is achieving a couple of things for them. They're psychologically convincing you that you're getting a good deal. Okay. So that makes you happy. And then they know that all that added sugar, added salt, and the chemicals they put in the food are going to trick your brain into craving more. So they're basically ensuring future sales with this portion problem that we have. Are you going to talk about the keto diet at all? Yeah, I'll talk about keto briefly. Okay. So portion size matters. So what I do now when I go out to eat is I try to find the best restaurant with the highest quality ingredients, uh, which tends to be the fancier restaurants, I will admit, which are pricier, and you get the plate with the one little thing on it, like this picture on the left. But I will tell you that you are paying for not going to an ICU in a few years. So the five-star Michelin, that's the kind of food they're going to serve you because most people that are going to those restaurants don't want poor quality life. They want to live longer. They want good brain health. They want good muscle health. They don't want diabetes. They don't want cancer. Okay. And so you know that you have to eat high quality food that is prepared beautifully and well in a minimal way. So you might be paying more for less food, but really what you're paying for is a reduced risk of a heart attack. You're paying for a reduced risk of stroke. You're paying for better mitochondrial health. Okay. Or you could go to the cheaper restaurant that slaps on a ton of food fried in three day old canola oil with the worst quality ingredients and no fiber whatsoever. You think you're getting a good deal because that's what they want you to think. And they tell you all the time, what a good deal, what a good deal. But really what you're doing is prepaying for your heart attack, in my opinion. First off, why are you eating anything fried? Yeah, we shouldn't be eating anything fried anyway, right? So just to give you a little bit of a snapshot of the financial implications of poor eating choices, uh, stroke, between 20 grand to 23 grand, this is out of pocket costs, treatment costs. Heart attack, 20 grand. I've read other data that a single massive heart attack will have a lifetime cost of $750,000 to somebody. A minor heart attack, 500,000. So the out of pocket costs of these health problems that are induced by eating poor quality foods from the food industry are massive. So the food industry is basically the customer of the pharmaceutical and the hospital industries, right? And people like me. We count on the food industry to give us customers. What I want you to do is not fall for that and, and start taking better care of yourselves so that you don't ensure these macroeconomic predictions that allow people to sell stock and make a ton of money. So back to our weight loss strategies. Remember I told you earlier that bariatric surgery is by far the most effective. That is still true. There is something coming up that's as effective, we think, and doesn't require surgery. And I'm going to talk about that. Very successful surgery. The rates are growing. 2011, there are about 158,000 of these procedures done in America. 2019, 256,000. Problem still is that a lot of insurance companies won't cover this. And you might be wondering, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't they cover something to make me healthier? You got to look at it from their perspective. Blue Cross or Aetna or United Health Group has no guarantee that you're going to stay with them for your life. So why would they pay for you to have a surgery that helped you 10, 20 years down the road when they don't know that you're going to be on them anyway? So if you start thinking about it the way they think about it, obviously they're never going to cover this preventative, uh, preventative surgery that makes you healthier because they don't benefit from your health later. It resolves most comor comorbidities. So the patients I've had that I've successfully been able to get into a bariatric surgery program end up far healthier, taking far fewer medicines, happier, doing more and more productive because their metabolic dysfunction was cured. It's not just the weight loss. OK, most weight is lost in the first couple of years after the surgery. And a lot of people do regress and gain weight back. That is a big problem with this. So there's a recurrence rate. The RUNY surgery is more successful than the sleeve surgery for weight loss. The ruin why you end up not ever being able to take anti-inflammatories again, which is a problem if you have like arthritis and things like that down the road, because there's very few ways to manage the pain associated with arthritis. Omega-3s help, tart cherry helps, turmeric helps. Those are natural things that won't mess with your gut. But if you've had a ruin why or are contemplating one, you're never going to be able to take an Advil or a Motrin again. Um, and then the sleeve you can, because all the sleeve does is affect the, 
like think of your stomach like a water balloon. They just put a bunch of staples and cut it in half. So you can only fill half of it. But you're still having this normal duodenum and small intestine, all the absorptive parameters. So you can still take anti-inflammatories because you, you're not bypassing certain sections of the system. So think of bariatric surgery as mechanical portion control. There's only so much you can eat, but there are other benefits to it as well. I just want to remind people that this tape, this, this recorded is on our website. Oh yeah, this is a recorded Facebook talk. You can watch it again. It's going to be on the website. So the Roux and Y versus the sleeve. So the Roux and Y, you're, you're effectively rerouting the guts, okay? To take food from one section straight to another section to basically not allow your body to absorb the nutrients, okay? So you're like bypassing the ability of the body to take in the nutrients. The sleeve bypasses the ability to take in the nutrients at the mouth level. So in the Roux and Y, you could really probably eat the same amount of food. You're just not gonna absorb it all. The vertical sleeve, you end up not being able to eat as much because your stomach just can't take it. So they've studied these head to head. There was about 8.4% more weight loss with the Roux NY than the vertical sleeve, okay? There was no difference in the ending outcomes of type two diabetes, sleep apnea, dyslipidemia, and then hypertension ended up better in the Roux NY group, but there was more esophagitis in the sleeve group. So all in all, it appears that the Roux NY is a better surgery in terms of outcomes. Um, but both work very, very well. And to date, because I think because it's easy to do, easier to do, it's a day surgery, the recovery is quicker, and there's less of that micronutrient absorption problem. So you don't have to worry about the anti-inflammatories. You probably don't have to take as many B12 supplements, things like that. 60% of these surgeries are the sleeve surgery to date. But this is very, very effective. So if you're in that group of people that are really struggling to lose weight, you're waiting for a total hip, you're waiting for a total knee, whatever diet you're doing is not working. If you're taking meds for hypertension, diabetes, I would strongly suggest you consider this surgery because it is very, very effective. Um, but there is another option for you potentially. All right, just talking about weight loss again. This is a picture from a plastic surgeon's website for liposuction. That's the, uh, the classic way to remove fat with surgery, right? You just effectively put in a vacuum and suck it out. Um, but I'll tell you the mechanism underlying the weight loss from surgery. So surgical weight loss, when I talk about that, I'm not talking about lipo, I'm talking about sleeve, Roux and Y bariatric surgery. It changes the eating behavior. So because there's this portion control sort of forced upon the person, over time, they get that mindset change accidentally. So they change their eating behavior just because they have to. Um, and then hopefully that becomes a habit that they don't change later. But I remember I told you there is a high recurrence rate and failure rate of the surgery. So over time, you reduce your energy and taking you have portion control. The body weight set point, remember how I told you the body likes to equilibrate and get to a certain basal metabolic rate? The body weight set point drops 20 to 30% after surgery. And then when you lose all the weight. So the weight takes a certain amount of calories to maintain itself. So a lot of overweight people think they need more food than they do because they're supporting the excess energy storage on their body. Once you get rid of that excess storage, then you don't need to eat as much. And then it, hopefully it's become a habit for you over time. But the real reason or one of the real reasons we think that bariatric surgery is working is because it's changing the signaling from the gut. So the nutrients, you eat a nutrient, it goes through your mouth, you swallow it, hits your stomach and your gut. And there is a whole host of receptors to include the bacteria that live in your gut that get that nutrition, sense the molecules and start sending out different signals to your body and brain. So bariatric surgery can actually change those gut signals, okay? And then over time you have a reduction in total energy intake and you will actually, with these surgeries, suppress the adaptive hunger response that is triggered by weight loss. So remember I told you a lot of people that have excess BMI feel like they need more food than they really do. Well, they're getting a hunger signal because the energy storage isn't being fed. Well, these bariatric surgeries suppress that hunger signal that is usually induced by the calorie restriction. And so you can maintain the lifestyle and you can get the mindset change. We think that's one of the reasons it works well. Next. All right, now let's talk about drugs, pharmacotherapy. Everybody's looking for the magic pill, right? Red pill, blue pill, which world do you wanna enter? So there are five FDA approved medications for long-term weight management as of 2021. 
Whether they're covered by your insurance plan or not, I have no idea. I'm going to guess probably not. There's Orlistat, Phentermine, Topiramate, Naltrexone, Bupropion, and guess how that works? It reduces cravings. That's the same thing we give people with opioid addiction, okay? Liraglutide and semaglutide. So Wagovi, Sixenda, Contrave, Casemia, Xenical. I can tell you I am able to get these covered for this many patients. So none of the private group health insurance in Louisiana is covering this that I'm aware of. And if they cover it, the patient copay is probably the full list price of the drug. All right, next slide. So the pharmaceutical strategies for weight loss. Everybody wants to talk about Manjaro. Everybody comes to my office and asking about Manjaro if they're not asking about Ozempic. And Manjaro actually has been a great, great medicine for weight loss. I've prescribed a lot of it. I hope to keep prescribing it because it does help people kickstart that mindset and lifestyle change and start changing how their brain and body perceive the need for food. Okay. So looking at different drugs, okay. They've looked at quisemia, which is the fentermine, which is basically like um, fenfen or adipex. Um, and then topiramate 67. And they looked at it versus placebo. 67% of people in the casemia group lost 5% uh, versus only 17% in the placebo group. So we know it works. 47% lost 10% of their body weight and only 7% in the placebo group lost 10% of their body weight. But think about this. That means with no changes, just taking a placebo, 17% of that group lost 5% of their body weight and then 7% lost 10% with a sugar pill or a sawdust pill. What does that tell you? The brain has a massive amount of control over everything going on in your body. And if you believe it, you can change it. That is what the placebo studies show us. Semaglutide, which is a GLP-1 inhibitor in the same, you know, the family of Manjaro and Ozembic, 14% weight loss versus 2.4% of the control group. And that was at 2.4 milligrams per week. Then there was a scale trial. And then there's Victoza and Trulicity, which are also GLP-1. What is GLP-1? We're about to talk about it. So there are some great pharmaceuticals out now that can help you on your quest for weight loss. Does someone have a question? Okay, we have a question. <clears throat> when taking a med temporarily of some kind for a metabolic dysfunction, help to get weight off a bit quicker to get hip surgery sooner? This individual had three blood clots and hips reabsorbed and still on Zoralto for a bit. The question was, if they take medicine, will they lose weight quicker? She's trying to say, like, would taking the medicine of some kind for the metabolic dysfunction help? The question is, would taking medicine of some kind for metabolic dysfunction help lose weight? Uh, I think the short answer is yes. It just depends on what is your source of metabolic dysfunction and what medicine you're talking about. Manjaro has been very, very successful in inducing weight loss in people, um, as has Ozembic. Ozembic is only covered for diabetics. And Manjaro really is only covered for diabetics. Um, it's really hard to get if you're not diabetic. And then you need to talk to whoever's managing your diabetes if you're going to go on these. She's because if, yeah, if you're on other diabetic drugs, you're not going to be a, you know, you don't want to mix and match certain ones. Um, but I've been able to successfully get this for non-diabetic people that are BMI of 30 or more. Um, I think it depends on where you live, your state, your insurance coverage. Is there a cash pay option? Things like that. But yeah, the short answer is the GLP-1s seem to be very effective in helping people lose weight. Um, and they seem to be safe so far. Next slide. And supplements. We'll talk about supplements at the end, but right now let me, let me get, get going about the GLP-1s. So how does this work? So <clears throat> these are gut-derived peptides. So peptides are just portions of proteins. They're a string of amino acids, but they just haven't become long enough or folded up enough to be a true protein. So it's a peptide. So insulin's a peptide. So the gut derived peptides are, are peptides that you make in your gut. Okay. When your gut senses nutrients. So when certain receptors are triggered, so there's GLP one is glucagon like peptide one. So this is the one that Manjaro and these other drugs are targeting. And it has a lot of effects on different aspects of your metabolism and on your brain, which is really how it works the best. There's also oxyntomodulin, peptide YY, cholecystokinin, neurotensin. Believe me, Big Pharma is looking at all of these and they're looking at combinations of these and they're going to come up with a blockbuster weight loss drug. Now, whether or not it's 
something you have to take your entire life and be beholden to them? I don't know. But for now, the GLP ones seem to be very effective. They seem to be safe. Biggest problem is not being covered. And then if you go off of them, you tend to gain the weight back, um, unless you've done all the other work with lifestyle and mindset change. All right. For the next. So this is a semaglutide step one trial. Um, and this is when it got its indication. I want to say this is Manjaro, got its indication for weight loss. So you see the placebo group versus the uh, semaglutide group, that big weight loss thing. Now, bear in mind, you can make those gaps look as big as you want, depending on the scale you put on the X and the Y axis. But in general, people on this medicine, assuming all other factors are the same in the study, you know, caloric intake, et cetera, exercise, which we already know exercise doesn't matter. But um, you do lose weight on these medicines, okay? It is an injection by, in general. There are some oral formulations, but most people inject it once a week. Uh, so 5% weight loss. Remember I told you you start seeing health benefits at 5%. 5 to 15 is generally the goal of your dietitian, your nutritionist, or your surgeon. 86% um, of people in the GLP-1 group lost that. Only 32% of the placebo group did. But that means one out of three just taking nothing. A fake medicine lost 5%. Nothing else changed. So how's that possible? And then for weight reductions of 15%, it was 51% versus 5%. So these drugs do work. Um, but I want you to also focus on the fact that the placebo also works. So you don't really need the drug then, do you? Um, we're going to talk about why that might be. Next. All right. So these are all of the effects of the GLP-1 agonist. So these are the peptides which act like little mini hormones. You eat, your gut senses a nutrient, it spits out these uh, peptides. Okay, so the glucagon <laughs> peptide one agonist, so those are the drugs, the Manjaro, the Ozembix. What that means is they, they have a molecular formula that attaches to the same receptor that the GLP-1 that your gut makes attaches to, okay? So it stimulates the receptor, it turns it on in a similar fashion to the native hormone. Now, these drugs are all made so that the... Um, the Manjaro, the Ozembic, is far more powerful than your normal natural hormone or peptide and lasts longer. So like the half-life is longer because a half-life, a GLP-1 is very short. But if you take these drugs, you only take the drug once a week. So the half-life is very, very long. Um, there, It's pleiotropic, which is science speak for it has multiple effects. So there's receptors for this peptide in the brain, in the GI tract, in the pancreas, in the cardiac muscle, and it gives you health benefit effects in all of these and in the liver. Okay, so just briefly, you increase your insulin sensitivity, uh, you decrease your blood glucose. So that's the primary indication of diabetes, right? Is to increase insulin sensitivity and drop blood glucose. The liver stops producing as much glucose because the glucagon, which normally makes your liver produce more glucose, that's shut down. Um, and then the most important effect is in the brain, which we're going to talk about next. But just know that when you take these drugs, you are not just, it's not just changing your blood sugar. It's doing a whole bunch of stuff through your whole system to help you lose weight. So more weight loss than the placebo, more waist circumference loss, which is a marker of metabolic dysfunction. Okay. I think women should be 35. No, women should be 30 inches and men should be 35. Uh, heart protective. So they've shown that there's better cardiac outcomes in the diabetics that use these drugs. And so now, of course, they're doing the cardiac studies uh, for people that aren't diabetic to see if it helps them. It's reduced blood pressure versus placebo. It reduces your CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, it reduces your hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of hyperglycemia over time. It helps your lipid levels. You have better physical functioning. So they've actually shown that people in this group that take the GLP-1s do more and perform more physically than the other groups. Visceral fat mass reduction, so less fatty liver. More weight loss is fat and not lean. One of the problems with straight up caloric restriction is a lot of people lose muscle as they lose fat, which is not good for you, obviously. Um, so I would say buy Eli Lilly's, I'm just kidding, I'm not getting stock advice, but I think these drugs are, I think they're gonna help a lot of people, assuming that the long-term side effect profile is beneficial. And remember the FDA pulls 5% of approved drugs off the market every single year because of side effects they didn't pick up in the initial studies. So we don't know about that yet, but right now all of these benefits are, it's almost too good to be true, but it works. I prescribe it a lot because it's been so helpful for people. 
All right, so the issues, what are your side effects now? So the short-term side effects are the same ones you see with metformin, okay? Nausea, some people get diarrhea, some people vomit, some people get constipated. Why? Because the gut's not emptying as fast as they're used to. And they're satiated sooner, so you get nauseated. It's like you, it's like you went to Thanksgiving dinner and ate everything on the table. That's how it makes you feel when you're not eating. Well, not that bad, but you get my point. So one of the ways it works is it makes you just feel like you're so, you don't want to eat because you're full. Um, and then that brings me back to the whole point of dieting and the whole point of weight loss, which is if you eat less, if you have portion control, you will lose weight over time because you will start to get into the fat reserves to provide the energy for your cellular function and your brain health. The gallbladder is a big problem. People with GLP, not a big problem. 2.6% of people had a gallbladder issue and then 1.2% of people with placebo. So it's about hundred percent more. Um, so the weight loss with semaglutide stems from reduction in energy intake, which is due to a decreased appetite, which is thought to result from a direct and indirect effects on the brain. So basically this is chemical portion control. So mind control is how these drugs really work. So we've had mechanical portion control, absorption portion control. Now we have brain controlled mindset portion control. But at the end of the day, it's all still portion control. So again, injectable glucose lowering meds. Again, it attaches a receptor in a stronger fashion and sticks around the body longer. Um, and basically it attaches to certain sections of the brain, which we're about to talk about that reduce appetite. So there's only certain reasons that you have hunger or you think you want food and it all has to do with your brain. So you take these GLP-1 inhibitors and this picture shows you delayed gastric emptying, okay? A is a normal person. So the, the green, the lime and the yellow and the blue stomach and over time, how it leaves the stomach, it goes into the intestines. B is rapid emptying. So some people have a problem where they eat and it just dumps right into their, their gut. That's a whole different issue. And then we have delayed gastric emptying on the bottom, which some people with diabetes get a condition called gastroparesis, which is where the gut doesn't work right. And you have delayed gastric emptying. And so you always feel like total um, poo poo, so to speak, after you eat, because the food just sits in your stomach and goes nowhere. That's what GLP-1 agonists are doing for you. They're delaying the gastric emptying. So by definition, you're going to feel fuller with any given amount of food. All right. And then incretin hormones, that's what this really is. So the incretin hormones are the peptides shot out by your gut upon eating. So normally they stimulate insulin secretion, which pulls glucose out of the blood, thus glucose lowering. In type two diabetics, this process seems to be blunted naturally. That's why a lot of big pharma started to look at this as a target and uh, lo and behold, it works really well. So you increase the levels of these incretins and then you get that insulin effect because the effect of the incretin or the GLP-1 on the pancreas. And so it's essentially reviving your insulin secretion. So obviously if you don't have a pancreas or your pancreas doesn't work at all, this is probably not the drug for you. Um, this is why you need to, you know, it's not sold at CVS to date. Uh, you still have to go get a prescription because somebody has to be monitoring everything you're on in your whole condition. Um, but the average weight loss is about 2.9 kilograms uh, over placebo in the time frame of these studies, which I want to say was eight weeks or so. So 2.9 kilograms, I want to say it's 2.4 kilograms per pound. Somebody fact check me on that one. Um, so maybe like five, six pounds. That's nothing to sniff at. So uh, the audience member who told me that you lost eight pounds in five weeks, I mean, that's pretty good. And you did it without the help of this drug. Uh, because that level was considered enough for the FDA to say, yes, that's, that's a good number. Relative contraindications would be somebody that already has gastroparesis or delayed gastric emptying, somebody that already has an inflamed gallbladder. But even in those cases, some physicians will still prescribe this because the benefits are so good and they'll just monitor the gallbladder. And then people with irritable bowel disease have problems with these kind of drugs. So why do all the commercials that you're getting blasted with say not for multiple endocrine neoplasia or medullary thyroid cancer? Well, they have to say it legally, uh, but it's because in one of the studies, it was shown that one of these GLP-1 agonists stimulated the release of another protein called calcitonin, and that led to hyperplasia or overgrowth of the thyroid gland in cells. And so anybody with a pre-existing thyroid tumor, in theory, if you take a GLP-1 inhibitor, it might blossom that forth. That's why they say that. 
Um, and then, of course, the biggest side effect or what a lot of physicians are fearful of, but the risk is actually pretty low, is acute pancreatitis. And in that case, death is possible. That's why physicians are scared of it. Um, so there is a warning label on all these drugs about that, about the potential to cause acute pancreatitis, potentially death. Um, and then you can monitor your amylase levels and your lipase levels, but unfortunately to date, none of the studies that have looked at this have found that the levels are predictive in any way, shape or form. We think that an amylase level of three times normal is probably not good. And we think abdominal pain when you're taking this is probably not good. But overall, the risk of pancreatitis is very, very low. And as long as somebody's monitoring you and following you, um, you could potentially still stay on the GLP-1 receptor agonist and still get all the health benefits. All right, so remember I told you I wanna to talk about the brain effects because this is where it all, the magic really happens. So you have reduced appetite because of the effect of the GLP-1 receptor agonists on the hypothalamus, which is the se section of the brain that induces appetite or satiate, satiety, I should say. And remember uh, leptin and ghrelin, the um, leptin's released to make you stop wanting to eat and ghrelin is released to make you hungry and wanna eat. All of that is modulated as well. Okay, so the central nervous system signals are not related to the nausea. So you're not not eating because you feel nauseated. The nausea is there too, but the real reason you're not eating is because the brain effects of the GLP-1 are making you literally not want to eat. Okay, so you don't want to eat. So what is it doing? It's changing your mindset. So it's just a chemical trick on your brain telling you, you don't want to keep eating those potato chips. You don't want those Cheetos. You just have no interest in it. And a lot of people can achieve this without the drugs. Um, and that's what I'm hoping for you because these things are very expensive. Who knows how long they'll be around? We don't know the long-term side effect profile. And obviously anytime you can not take a medicine, that's better. Um, but I would say these are good drugs as far as drugs go. And I prescribe them obviously, but the real reason they work is they're changing the way you think about food. Okay. The surmount one study, they, the data was presented at the American Diabetic Association meeting. That was 2,539 subjects, and they had a statistically superior and clinically meaningful weight reduction. So those are the words that let your drug get approved by the FDA, which means you can then bill insurance, okay? Now, whether your insurance covers it or not, I don't know. There was a copay program with Eli Lilly for a while, but now there's a national shortage of these drugs and it's really, really hard to get these meds. And unfortunately, a lot of celebrities have been talking about it and they take it to lose an extra pound or half pound. And so now there's not enough drug left for a lot of diabetics out there. It's kind of a big problem right now. Um, but maybe if you're in a category of people with a BMI of 30, 40, 50, you're having trouble losing weight, I might go talk to your physician about this drug. So they're actually now even looking at these drugs to control addiction, including, guess what, sugar addiction. And that's the real problem in America is sugar addiction. Um, sugar is hedonic, meaning it induces pleasure. It stimulates the pleasure zones in your brain. The food industry knows this. They put sugar in your potato chips, believe it or not, because they need to get things craveable. They want to be able to say, bet you can't eat just one. Okay. So sugar will lead to craving, binging, tolerance, withdrawal which are the cardinal symptoms of addiction. You crave it, you binge it, you begin to tolerate it and need more and more and more. And if you stop taking it, you have withdrawal. Anybody that you know, and you might have a sugar addiction, you've tried to cut sugar and you know that all of that is true. So GLP-1 receptor agonists are being looked at to treat addiction, to include sugar addiction in much the same way that uh, Suboxone or Bupropion, or um, sorry, the uh, Naltrexone has been used to sort of turn down the mu opioid receptors that induce the pleasure that is associated with sugar. Most addictions take about five weeks to kick, okay? The first two weeks being quite miserable for somebody because of that tolerance and withdrawal situation going on along with the craving. If you can get through those first two weeks, then you're well on the road to being over your addiction. Then the next three weeks sort of cements it and does what? Changes your brain, changes your mindset. It's all about your mindset. So you have to, your brain has to believe that you don't want the sugar and you're just not interested. And then guess what? You're probably not gonna eat the sugar. And guess what? You'll be a lot healthier. GLP-1 seem to help along this process. Now, what happens when you come off of it? Do you immediately crave it again? Nobody really knows it's being studied. Next slide. All right, so in general, from what I've told you, bariatric surgery, 
uh, either the ruin wire or the sleeve, chemical, turning down portion control, leaving 20% on the plate, caloric restriction. In general, eating less food seems to be very successful for weight loss, okay? I did not say exercise, right? You have to eat less food. You have to eat less bad food. You have to eat less poor quality, ultra processed food. Now, could you eat as much salad as you want? Probably, as long as it's not a salad from a fast food restaurant that has a lot of added sugar and fats from all the crap they put on it and the dressing. But in general, eating less, I probably should have put ultra processed, poor quality food. It's highly successful for weight loss. GLP-1 agonists help people lose weight because they reduce appetite because they tell your brain basically says, I'm not, I don't want that. I don't need that. I have no interest in that. Bariatric surgery works by forced portion control and then also induces changes in the incretin levels, which also does that brain effect. Caloric restriction works because you have less food. So I will tell you about a third of those on these GLP-1 and drugs lost 20% of the total weight, which is awesome if you think about it. And the same as the bariatric surgery uh, outcomes at one to three years. So if these GLP-1 agonists can get a weight loss indication from the FDA and can get coverage, I think that that's going to probably be the way most people go, because why would you not do a weekly injection instead of a surgery? That's what I would do. Um, but my preference is to not do any of this and to do it all naturally with a healthy Mediterranean diet in a reasonable time restricted manner. And I'm going to talk about that. And it's just no one thing. It's a combination of everything. Yeah, there is no magic pill. The GLP ones I think are being looked at as some sort of magic pill, but you still have to eat quality foods if you want to live a long, healthy, productive life. But what if you could find a way to eat less without needing a drug or needing a surgery or having to be an inpatient in a hospital or have your food given to you by a dietitian? What if you had the, you know, the power to do it yourself? So one way that you can do this is with time restricted eating or intermittent fasting. You may or may not have heard of this. Again, this is out of the anti-aging and longevity world, but we've learned that the benefits of following the circadian rhythm, remember we developed on a planet with oxygen, water, sunlight. So we are creatures of the sun, just like plants are, just like everything on this planet is. And humans have certain functions that are relevant in the day and certain functions that are relevant at night. Um, it's very important to have a solid bedtime that doesn't vary that much every day and a solid wake up time. Okay. It's very important to get seven, eight hours of sleep. Nothing that you do is going to work for weight loss unless you're sleeping. All of the functions of weight loss happen in conjunction with a good solid night's sleep. And that's been shown in study after study. Poor sleep is highly correlated with weight gain and obesity. Shift work, highly correlated with weight gain and obesity and all of the NCDs of the world to include cancer and arthritis. So what you really should do if you want a solid lifestyle, lifetime plan for all of the health benefits that I've been talking about is you need to match your eating window to the circadian rhythm. So what does that mean? You can't eat all day. So most Americans eat for about 15 hours of the day. Think about that. That leaves, what, nine hours where you're not eating? That's terrible. So you need to get to at least a 12-12 schedule. I do a 10-14. A lot of people advocate for an 8-16. Now, I'll tell you, the human data on this is pending. They're still working on studies. But time-restricted eating in a short window each day, particularly if you can push it earlier, it matches when your pancreas is normally supposed to be spitting out insulin. It matches when your body's normally spitting out cortisol, you're fasting when you're supposed to be on melatonin, all of the repair, restoration, stress response, cell cleanup and maintenance things happen while you're sleeping and they work best fasted. So all of the benefits of sleep are even better if you can sleep empty, like in a fasted state. So time restricted eating is not only a way to match the circadian rhythm and get all of the cellular function working better. And I'll I think in a slide, yeah, the bottom here, uh, they figured this out because that, I think it was Sachin Pander, there was another PhD that figured this out. They found that mice that were given an obesogenic diet, so they actually have a diet that matches the American diet that they know will give di uh, mice obesity and diabetes. So that's how they create diabetic mice to study different drugs and things in the lab. They found that the ones that were fed an obesogenic diet that honored their circadian rhythm, and those are nocturnal creatures, right? So the ones that were fed the obesogenic diet when they're supposed to be active normally at night actually never really developed the metabolic problems, even though they were given the same diet. It's the ones that were fed the obesogenic diet all day long and that ate it when they were supposed to be asleep. Um, those are the ones that got the problems. So studies are ongoing. We know this works well on animals. 
Um, the human studies are very encouraging and seem, there seem to be a ton of benefits with matching your life to the circadian rhythm. Um, and again, there's different windows you can take. But if you time restrict eat, by definition, it's really hard to eat too much anyway. And then if you tell yourself you're only going to eat healthy foods during that window, it's almost impossible to eat too much, I think. But now, if you tell yourself, I'm going to only eat for four hours a day, but you eat 20 bags of Cheetos, we might have a problem here. But I want you to start thinking about time-restricted eating as another weapon to be able to induce a lifestyle change and a mindset change without the needs of surgery or drugs. We have a question? Yeah, they don't understand the, the windows you talk You didn't explain the windows. Oh, the windows. Yeah, sorry. When I say window, I mean your feeding window. Like, like when you allow yourself to eat. So like when I'm trying to coach patients and get them on this protocol, the easiest way to start is a 12 hour window. So you can only eat from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Once you get that down and that becomes second nature and you never ever want to eat at 8.05 or 8.10 and you're never eating at 6 or 7 in the morning, um, then you can go to a 10 hour. So like 8 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m. or 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. You see what I mean? So there's only 10 hours of the day that you ever eat anything. Now you can have water. There's a big debate over black coffee, big debate over coffee with heavy cream because heavy cream does not induce an insulin spike, which is one of the reasons the, anything that induces an insulin spike is going to induce weight gain, right? And problems. So the goal of time restricted eating is to keep your glucose level um, and normal when you should be fasted. What's 10, 14? A 10, 14 is you're only eating for 10 hours of the day and you're not eating for 14 hours. So your gut can rest and your body can rest and you're fasted for 14 hours of the day. So all of those stress response, mitochondrial repair, DNA repair, cell membrane repair, protein repair, all that can happen. It works best in a fasted state. So every single day you're giving your body a chance to repair itself and improve itself. And that's why time restricted eating has so many health benefits. Now, some, some scientists are more advocates of intermittent fasting. What that means is you eat normally most days of the week, but one day you don't eat anything at all, or two days you don't eat anything at all. Two, five is the most common for people that like to intermittent fast. So they'll eat for five days of the week and they fast for two days in a row, nothing. And that really kicks you into ketogenesis, okay? Where you run out of all glycogen and glucose and you start burning fat only. And then you start producing what are called ketones, which is a breakdown product of the fatty acids that is an alternative fuel source for your brain. And then, so people on a ketogenic diet often have a lot of energy. They're sharp. They feel like they can think better. They feel better and everything goes better for them because of the ketogenic effect, um, because it's good for the brain, basically in, in, in a nutshell. You hit that ketosis, everybody's different, but the two day fast, most people are gonna hit that ketone thing. Um, that's why some people like intermittent fasting. I'm a bigger fan of time restricted eating because I think that the circadian rhythm is massively important for human health. And the only way to match that is to time restrict eat. You're not matching it if you're not eating at all, or if you're eating whatever you want, whenever you want on the days you're eating. So you're not really following the sun in those situations. Um, but again, nobody's really looked at that. There's no studies to support what I'm saying. That's just my fundamental philosophical notion based on everything I've read. Um, so again, the studies are going on, but one way to try to do your own portion control is just shorten the number of hours you eat every day. And you'll be doing yourself two favors. You'll have portion control and also you'll allow your body to go into that rest state where you can actually repair, detox, fix DNA mutations, things like that. Stop the snacking unless it's a fruit or vegetable. Uh, yeah, snacking at night is a big no-no. Um, not even a fruit or vegetable if you're in your fasted state. Because like a, fruit, fruit a, day. a fruit or a vegetable, even if you're in your fasted state, is still going to induce a glycemic response. So when you're fasting, you should be fasting. Um, and then during the day, if you're in a time-restricted window, I'm not saying eat continuously. Uh, have meals and then try not to snack between the meals, and you'll find you'll automatically eat less. So there is some evidence. Now, I put this here, picture of Guangzhou, China, and then my my new favorite Netflix documentary about all of the different ways they prepare and think of food in China. It's very, very interesting. Uh, this was 139 patients in Guangzhou, China. Um, and it's a New England Journal of Medicine study, which is a pretty big deal journal. Okay, it's fairly recent. I will say that it's a little difficult to believe a lot of data coming out because you just don't know because the information is so controlled coming out of China. But we'll take this for what they say. 
they had a caloric restriction study, 15 to 1800 kilocalories per day. And so what they were trying to, to just determine is, is it the caloric restriction or is it the time restricted eating? But I think they didn't look at one group they should have looked at. So they looked at one group with time restricted eating and caloric restriction and one group with uh, without time restricted eating, but caloric restriction. So both groups were caloric restricted. Just one had time restricted eating. And they found the weight change was not that different in the two groups over a year. And this was a 10 hour eating window. So from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. or so. That, and they lost on average about 17.6 pounds in a year. So again, that's just a little over a pound a month, uh, which is a good rate to lose weight. And it's obviously you can maintain that and it's sustainable. But they didn't look at, you know, all of the long-term longevity effects of mitochondrial cell health and stress response and mood, all that stuff, which goes with time-restricted eating and following a circadian rhythm, I think. I will tell you that most people in China, I think, are better about following circadian rhythm than we are because a lot of them are still rural and live that rural lifestyle where you're up at dawn and, and asleep at dusk. So another study, 90 subjects, one group was allowed to eat over 12 hours. That was your control group. And one group was only allowed to eat for eight hours a day. That's your 816 um, window that we talked about. They found that the time restricted eating group in the study was non-compliant one day a week or so. And I will tell you all of the longevity studies and the cellular health and metabolic dysfunction studies are pretty clear that you need to establish a set rhythm and really don't deviate from it. Or you get what's called social jet lag or jet lag. Um, and you basically lose all the benefits you were gaining from following this particular rhythm of eating and waking and sleeping. So the fact that they were non-compliant one day a week or so, it's kind of a bad point in the study, I think. But they found over time, just shutting down that eating window, eating window from 12 to eight hours. So just eliminating four hours of when you told yourself you could eat, cut your calories by 214 a day. And that's significant. You're going to lose weight with that, assuming everything else stays the same. The other thing they found was blood pressure got better. Moods got better. Depression was improved. There was less fatigue in the people that had a smaller eating window because they gave their bodies a chance to get better and repair itself. So the body was allowed to fix itself for 16 hours a day versus the 12 hours. So as long as you're taking in energy, your body never goes into that repair cycle. And then there was more weight loss, obviously. So it's very, very important, I think, to start thinking about a good sleep schedule, solid sleep, and then matching your eating window to your wake cycle. And then let's talk about mindset. Remember how I told you the GLP-1s really just change how you think about food? Bariatric surgery ultimately does that. Uh, mindset is the number one factor here. So these are the technical definitions. So like beliefs, guide attention and motivation in ways that shape your physiology and behavior. So your mindset tells you what you're going to pay attention to and how you're motivated about certain things. It's a lens or a frame of mind that orients you to a particular set of associations and experiences. So one thing I tell myself is, <clears throat> you know, you may think you want that bowl of Cheetos, right? But there's probably some food product in the middle of nowhere in China that would normally entice you all the time if you were there, but you have no interest in it whatsoever. Why? Because it's out of sight, out of mind, and you don't care about it. And you can trick your brain into thinking that way about that bag of Cheetos you're looking at. Just think of it as that's, you know, some slug somewhere that normally people would crave, but I don't because I just don't. Um, this is what I'm talking about with mindset. And that's kind of an oversimplification, but you're basically changing your frame of orientation or your viewpoint. You're telling yourself, I just don't want processed food. I only want good stuff that I know is going to be highly beneficial to my mitochondria. I don't want a food product that I know is going to give me a mutated DNA and start a cancer focus that's going to grow to a tumor in a few years. That's what I'm talking about with mindset. The picture on the bottom shows you the dopamine hit you get from sugar and the dopamine hit you get from cocaine. Sadly, you get a bigger dopamine hit from sugar. This is why it's so addictive. This is what the food industry knows this, they understand it, and they use it to their advantage and your disadvantage, okay? People that continually eat sugar, it's basically you've trained your brain to associate that with all that is good in the world because of the dopamine hits. So you have to get that under control. You have to control your mindset about the clinical efficacy or ability to work of a method and about your capacity to change. So you have to believe you can change. You have to believe that eating less will help you. 
You have to believe that eating better, higher quality foods will help you. And then you just have to be all in with your brain. And that's what I'm talking about with mindset. So mindset and sugar are ultra processed foods. You've been told over the years that sugar, cane sugar, agave, all these things are okay. You've been told juice is okay. It's not okay. You've been lied to completely. So sugar and ultra processed foods, not only do they get you addicted and craving more and more and more, but they change the brain's ability to have executive control. So ultra processed foods and sugar effectively make you even more prey to the food industry because you have less mental ability to say no. So you have less executive function. You don't have that grown up adult. I'm just not going to do that. I'm just not interested. Okay. It's basically a teen and preteen brain is what they're creating with ultra processed and sugary foods. So a lot of impulsivity, a lot of emotion, no executive control. All right. So the first trick is you have to believe in your heart of hearts that eating less will help with weight loss. And you have to have a realistic uh, understanding of how much you are eating. Um, some people believe they're not eating that much, but they really are eating a lot. And so you do kind of have to sit down and have a, a moment with yourself, some self-awareness over what you really are eating. And that if I eat less, I will probably lose weight. OK. And then you have to believe that you can eat less. A lot of people just believe they can't. They've already given up before they even start. Now, remember, I talked about placebos being the most studied and most effective drug of all time. This is why most drug studies have to be done against the placebo. The only reason placebos work is because people have the expectations that it will work. They believe that it's going to work. And just by the brain believing in it, it does work. So if a placebo can make people lose five to 10 percent of the body weight, nothing else has changed. How does that work? It's because they believe that it's working and they don't they don't want to eat that food. They get their own portion control. You can do this without a drug. Just remember that if the placebos work, anybody can do it. So you have to eliminate the current mindsets I hear all the time of, oh, obesity runs in my family. I'm never going to be able to lose weight. Oh, my mom and dad both have diabetes. It's just, it's in my genes. It's just going to happen no matter what. Those are the mindsets that the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry and the hospital industry and the surgeons are counting on, that you're not going to change and that you'll continue to have the problems that we can swoop in and fix. You have to eliminate these mindsets. All right, so you need what's called a growth mindset and you need to get rid of learned helplessness, okay? Every day you need to improve and tell yourself you're improving and believe it, okay? Most patients, and they've studied this, most patients want a way to improve their motivation for weight loss. So most diet studies, when they talk to patients and say, why did you fail or why did you gain your weight back? They usually always indicate a lack of motivation to continue. They just gave up. 67.5% report that they did not have sufficient motivation to continue on their lifestyle change quest. And then when their mindset and focus changes, when how they view the world changes, their motivation improved, the motivation changed. And shifts in mindset that have been studied for pre-meal planning have shown this. Okay, so in this study, the subjects were asked to focus their mindset in a few different ways. In one group, they were asked to focus on the health aspects of what they were about to eat when they were prepping their meals. Focus on how it's going to help your DNA not mutate. Focus on how it's going to help the bioenergetics of your mitochondria. Focus on how it's going to help reduce dementia risk. So they were asked to focus on the health effects and the benefits of the foods they were selecting and the portions for their pre-planned meals. The next group, they were asked to focus on the pleasure that they were going to get from eating the food. Focus on how it's going to make you feel, how you like the taste of it, how it satisfies you. And then the third group was asked to focus on whether or not it was going to keep them full until dinner time. And then they looked at the overall outcomes of these three groups with regard to their mindset or what they were asked to think about when they were prepping the meals. In the health mindset, every single subject reduced their portion size. Okay, when you just start becoming self-aware and just start every time you make a meal or you're prepping a plate or you're putting food on your plate at a restaurant or whatever, if you think about the health benefits of that food product or the lack of health benefits, you're automatically going to change your behavior and generally will reduce your portion size and pick better foods. So that is a health growth mindset. You have to train your brain to think about this all the time. The people that focus on the pleasure aspects, the hedonic aspects of the food, 
Did it taste good? Does it have good mouth feel? Is it crunchy? Does it give me that salty, sugary thing I want? The group that was heavier, the obese people, never modified their behavior. The portion sizes never changed. They, in fact, picked larger portions. So you have to tell you, you, you got to stop thinking about the pleasure aspects of the food you're eating. Focus more on the health aspects. You've automatically changed your mindset. You will automatically change your portion size. You will automatically change the quality of the foods that you're selecting. And then the fullness mindset, that didn't seem to show anything in terms of reward or change portion size. So basically when I read this study, it basically tells me what I, what I already know. When I think about food, if I think about how healthy it is or what it's going to do to my insides and like how my brain's going to work in a few years, it dramatically changes my behavior. I mean, I don't think I've touched a donut in over a year or more. And when I have, it's been like one small bite because I know it's just not worth it. It's a total waste of time to eat that thing. When I could go eat six pieces of whole grain, multi-grain, high fiber bread, and it would still be better for me. So start having a health growth mindset when you're thinking about food and prepping it. And that's going to help you. And then what they found too, even better, the health mindset induce activity where? In what's called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of the brain. What does that mean? That is your executive control. The front outer cortex of your brain is where you manage all of your impulsivity control, make all of your good executive decisions. Everything that you think about, about being a mature adult functioning society happens in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That is the executive running the, the, the company, right? It is usually less active in obese people. This has been in functional MRI studies. This is objective fact that people that tend to eat a lot more and have excess energy storage on their frames have less activity in their executive function of the brain. The health mindset can turn that around. So you can, you can basically train your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to be more active, to control your impulses to eat bad foods just by thinking about healthiness when you're doing it. Now that's amazing to me. That is an easy, cheap, free thing that you can do, anyone can do. And then the attention assigned to that task plays a very large role in your food intake. So the more you think about health and benefits and wellness and all that when you're sitting down to eat, the more the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex kicks in to protect you. So basically having a health mindset or growth mindset that I can lose weight, this food is good for me. Uh, I know that this is gonna help my mitochondria, my DNA, it's gonna do this, that, whatever. Starting to think that way induces more activation of the self-control network in the brain. Oh, what just happened? Oh, no. Basically being aware and forcing attention on health trains the brains, right? So over time, you're gonna find that every time you see um, like a piece of chocolate cake like this, you're just gonna be not interested because you have such a good health mindset. Your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is so robust and helpful, reduces the impulse because the pleasure aspect of that food does not outweigh the damage that it's gonna to do to you and your body and your brain, even with just one serving. So you start to learn that and you believe it and it becomes part of you and your behavior will change. So do not succumb to the learned helplessness that most of our country wants you to succumb to. They, they want you to feel helpless. They don't want you to have dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activity. They don't want you to have executive function. They want you to buy as many potato chips as you can, drink as much soda as you can, eat as much cake as you can, eat as many burgers as you can, get French fries every day. This is what they want because that is what is keeping the economy hum humming and making money. And then guess what? Then you go to the hospital, you have a heart attack, you stay in the ICU, you've given all of that business, you've taken the drugs, you've given all of that business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that is all counting on your mindset to their advantage. And it's worked for years and years and years, right? And one of the reasons it works is because the ultra processed food and the sugar that they put in the food is making it harder to activate your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So you almost have to detox off of the processed foods for a couple of weeks and then engage in the health mindset. And I think that you have a chance. Uh, okay. So these are, <laughs> these are phrases. This little cartoon shows you. So this is a cartoon that demonstrates all of the studies they've done over learned helplessness. So this little elephant is tethered to a stake when it's a baby and it, and it can only move as far as a chain lets it. But because it grows up like that and that becomes its own reality, when it's an adult and clearly it can pull the stake out of ground, it just doesn't because it just believes it can't. 
It has learned helplessness. That is what I want you to get away from. And I want you to have a good growth mindset. So a lot of people say, I'm obese because it's in my genes. A lot of people say, I can't lose weight because my feet hurt. A lot of people say, it's no use. I hardly eat anything and I still gain weight. And then my favorite, oh, I'm 50. So of course I'm going to get fat. All of that is learned helplessness. I need you to just get rid of that. Those thoughts are terrible and they're never going to help you. Let's talk about genes really quickly. All right. A lot of people think that the genes are everything that, oh, it's genetic. I have no chance. Again, that's learned helplessness. Genes really only affect about 10% of any of your health outcomes. The rest is environment and what you eat and diet and lifestyle. Okay. 90% of you is controlled by the environment that you live in and that you give yourself to include what you eat. You are in control and you have to understand that your genes aren't. They may control a portion of you. And we'll talk about true genetic problems that induce weight gain. But by and large, most people don't have those problems and you are in control. Mindset is important. It is heavily influenced by your family. So if your family's sitting around saying, oh, we never lose weight. Oh, these cheetahs are good for us. Oh, organic food's terrible. Oh, bacon is meat candy and the greatest thing in the world, which is kind of funny. Um, but if you're surrounded by a family that is pro not being healthy, it's really hard to break that mindset. I get it. You're gonna, it's going to take some work. Culture. Look at our culture. Drive down the street. How many fast food restaurants do you count? How many health restaurants do you count? It's probably 20 to zero, right? So our culture is very pro obesity. So we have to like break the mindset of what we're surrounded by. Go to the grocery store. I mean, you, there's very few places you can go in a grocery store that have whole natural foods. And then the social environment. So for instance, you, you guys have probably all heard about drug reps bringing food to doctor's offices. It really doesn't happen as often as you think it does. Uh, but if a rep comes to my office, they know they better only bring healthy food if they bring anything at all, because I don't want a bunch of terrible food around because I know it's bad for people, including me, including my employees. And why would I do that to them? So that's the social environment I've tried to develop in my office is very pro health try to encourage, I mean, I, I'm not forcing anybody to do anything, but I try to encourage people to be healthier. So you can get into a better social environment or create it yourself. You can choose to believe the culture we live in with a fast food culture we live in or not. And you could choose to believe that it's genetics only, or you can choose to not believe that. I'll tell you the science supports not believing that. Get a growth mindset. And then don't let the food industry keep you down because they are counting on it. All right. Wait, go back. I want to talk about the CNS. So the central nervous system neuronal pathways that control the hedonic or the pleasure producing aspects of food intake, these are the major drivers of weight gain. So basically, we need to get rid of the fact that eating ultra processed, highly salty, highly sugar added foods induce that dopamine hit from that slide I showed you. That's what we need to get away from. Whole natural foods do not do that to your brain. And therefore, you don't you don't live to eat, you eat to live. You start to eat just because, you know, you have to eat to live, but it doesn't become the central aspect of your entire being. Obesity has been linked to disinhibition, lack of executive control. So the prefrontal cortex, which is where quote unquote willpower lives, that is diminished in people that have a lot of weight gain over time. But you can get it back with that health mindset we talked about. And also getting off of the sugar addiction and controlling the relative ratios of dopamine in your brain, which have been altered over the years of these bad foods. So a lot of work to do, but it's all totally possible. You just can't believe the hype that's being fed to you by the society. Okay, next. So there are some genetic things they're doing these GWAS studies, which is gene-wide gene association studies, where they just check every gene and everybody for, and then try to look for associations with certain conditions. And so for early onset severe obesity, there are some genetic conditions that are higher relative genetic contribution to um, environment. But by and large, most people are on the right side, the polygenic common obesity. So from a bunch of different causes. Um, so monogenic genetic ones are rare, polygenic is common. So let's talk about the couple that are rare. So Prader-Willi syndrome is a chromosome 15 problem and it's SIM1 gene deletion. And then there's another one, Bardet beetle, and I'm sure there's more, uh, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. And these are all particular deletions of particular genes, okay? 
And then for Prater Willie, they have 10, it's a syndrome. So they tend to be certain clinical features or phenotypes that go with this massive weight gain that happens early in life. The hyperphagia starts at age one. So these, these children starting at age one are never not hungry. And it's a genetic problem. It's about one in 10,000 or one in 15,000 people. They tend to have narrow temples, almond eyes, uh, thin upper lip <clears throat> and developmental delay. So there are some genetic conditions that promote obesity, but the common person in America who is a BMI of 30 plus, it is not a single gene deletion. It is usually environment only with maybe a very small contribution from some genetic issue. And then what about emotional eating? So 60% of overweight, and this is from studies where, where they've talked to people, are emotional eaters. They admit to it. It's a tendency to overeat in response to negative emotions. So when you're happy and like something great happens, you're not running to McDonald's to get a Whopper or that's Burger King, sorry, a Big Mac. But the people that are depressed, something bad happened, that's what they do for some reason. So it's associated with negative emotions, not positive in general. And they target highly processed foods that are high in fat and sugar. Why? Because it hits the dopamine response, which people believe makes them feel better. But what happens over time is every time you hit dopamine, there's a crash. Then the next dopamine hits a little bit lower, a bigger crash, so on and so forth. And this is when tolerance develops. And this is when you escalate doses. This is why drug addicts have to take more and more and more because the dopamine goes less and less and less with each dose. Same thing happens with sugar. Again, counted on by the food engineers. And then emotional eating's effect on weight gain is independent of smoking, diet habits, or how much somebody drinks. So emotional eating is a big deal. And it seems, it seems to come from internal cues. So like stuff inside of you, like your anxiety level, your stress level. It's more powerful uh, to induce emotional eating if you're anxious, depressed, and stressed out, then let's say you weren't anxious, you weren't depressed, and you were plopped down in a candy store, you're probably not gonna eat all that candy, right? But an emotionally anxious and stressed out person who's plopped down in a health food store will probably leave that health food store and go look for candy. You see what I'm saying? So the internal brain things are way more powerful than what's around you. So your internal mindset is the most important factor in what you put in your body. That's why I'm saying mindset is something that has been ignored and should not be ignored. So you got to pay attention to the present moment and be very purposeful about what you do and don't judge yourself. If you're upset and you're sad and you're depressed, be upset and sad and depressed. Don't try to hide it with a dopamine hit from a donut. Okay. And then focus the awareness on your emotions. Just be non-judgmental. Once you become aware, oh, I don't really want that donut because I know that it doesn't do anything for my health benefits. I think I just want it because I'm feeling a little bit stressed out about that test I'm about to take. That self-awareness is hugely important to controlling your mindset. Tolerate and accept your internal experience, feel it, live it, be mindful about it, and then you'll start to see changes possible. And don't feel compelled to act on your emotions by eating, just accept and understand the emotion, feel the emotion. Don't try to hide it with a donut or with a cookie or with a Cheeto. So if you're sad, be sad, don't try to hide it with eating. So I'm saying this is what emotional eating is. And then know that your primitive brain and the brain the food industry is counting on, know that the emotions, the hypothalamus are gonna to wanna to override the prefrontal cortex, but make sure that your prefrontal cortex understands what is happening. Now, if you have total self-awareness and you still wanna eat the donut, that's a whole different thing. But a lot of people don't even have the self-awareness to know what they're doing. So I'm just asking you to start that mindfulness, being self-aware, but don't judge yourself, just understand. And I will tell you that obesity in children is a big problem. I didn't really get into it much in this talk, but now not only is it causing fatty liver, diabetes in kids, but we think it's also affecting brain development. So we have to get this problem under control in this country. Like I've said, the way we've been thinking about it has not worked at all to date, full stop. We are way un more unhealthy now than we ever were. So this is why I'm trying to give you different ways to think about it and different tactics and strategies. So ultra processed food is the number one enemy. It does cause excess calorie intake. It does cause weight, weight gain, but it also causes mitochondrial dysfunction and failure, DNA mutations, cell membrane breakdown, oxidative stress, chronic inflammation. I could go on and on and on. So the number one thing you have to do is avoid ultra processed foods, if at all humanly possible. And then again, back to the very first slide, it's not how much you eat, but what you eat. 
Okay, so the Mediterranean diet is by and large the healthiest, I think. Now, a lot of people will debate that, but it gives you a lot of the micronutrients that you need um, and also is beneficial to your mitochondrial health, to biogenesis, to autophagy and mitophagy, which is when you clean up the bad stuff and spew it out and recycle it. Um, and you're not going to get that with ultra processed foods. You're going to get the opposite. So control when you eat with time restriction, like we talked about, control your mindset. And then when you do eat, try to make sure it's not ultra processed foods. And I guarantee you the accident of all of that is going to be massively good health and weight loss just with those simple tricks. So mindfulness-based eating awareness training is actually something that people do. It's kind of what I just talked about with you. Um, and it's been used in binge eating programs. And 63% of the reviewed studies showed that just mindfulness was effective in reducing emotional eating. These people didn't need bariatric surgery. They didn't need GLP-1 receptor agonists, okay? They just became aware of what they were doing, self-awareness, and that was all they needed. Why? Because their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex kicked in, which is all these other things do for you. And when you eat might even be more important. I personally believe we need to follow the circadian rhythm a bit more from everything I've read. And I think you're going to see over the next decade that that's going to be true. Uh, more and more studies are being shown. But I think avoiding midnight snacking, God forbid, is for sure. Try not to do shift work if it's at all possible. Get a good night's sleep and be fasted when you're sleeping. Um, when when TRF, is it better to fast in the morning or at night? For time restricted feeding, the question is, is it better to fast in the morning or the night? Uh, again, we're trying to follow the sun and circadian rhythm and your natural cortisol and melatonin um, production. Uh, generally, the earlier, the better. So the earlier your window can be with your particular life and job and family, the better. Yes. So more at night. No, fast at night. Fast at night. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the three psychological skills, that, to my understanding, that are needed for weight loss are values clarification. Again, you want to believe that you can get better and that you deserve to get better and healthier and that health and wellness is a value of yours. Mindfulness, we've talked about, and then <laughs> stress tolerance. You have to be able to handle stress. So like when you're anxious, when you have a test coming up, uh, when something stressful happens in your family. So you, you have to have distress tolerance. Okay, so those are three fundamental skills. And then just as an aside, we've been talking about the obese and people with lack of impulse control. And, you know, there's another group of people that are the opposite. And there is a very small group of people, but it's one of the most dangerous mental health disorders there is, which is anorexia. So people, they've actually looked at anorexic brains and obese brains with uh, functional MRI studies. And in this study, they gave an anorexic images of high calorie foods, okay? So let's say like brownies, French fries, whatever. And in, in, in the anorexic brain, those foods induced massive activity in the prefrontal cortex. So the people that don't eat at all, like anorexics, have almost too much executive control or executive function that overrides the pleasure or hedonic aspects induced by these pleasurable foods. The opposite problem is true with people of BMI 40, 50 or so. So we need to get that brain in the middle where it's good in both sides, okay? You have to have some executive function, but you don't want too much. But it's interesting to see that people with the opposite problem of obesity have the opposite brain problem too much dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activity versus too little of it. So I think there's a lot to the neuroscience of weight control. Um, so again, in the obese compared to lean people, and this is objective factual neuroimaging studies, there's less activation of the executive control function of the brain versus um, in the normal or lean person or normal BMI. And the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, okay, is critical for your appetite control, for food craving, again, one aspect of the addiction problem we talked about, and the executive function, the health mindset. So it's a good target for therapy, of course. So guess what the drug companies are doing? Looking at ways to induce activity in the prefrontal cortex. But you know that you can do it just by adopting a health mindset. So the first thing you need to do is understand that industry has hijacked your brain. They have used all of this against you on purpose. Ultra processed foods promote a lack of executive function, which means that you eat more and more and more of their particular product. It increases dopamine hits and an addiction brain. So you have an addicted brain to these foods. And then the, um, 
the dopamine, of course, the levels get lower and lower and lower, right? And then, of course, all of our food is very heavy in omega threes, and I mean, I'm omega six and not omega threes because of all of our corn oil, soybean oils, all these oils that are heavy in omega six that have dominated the food supply because it's in everything you eat. And so, mental health is dependent on omega three levels. And so you have less of that distress tolerance, right? Again, all of this by design. That's one of the reasons I supplement with omega-3 to increase my stress resilience and it's worked. And that's something you can do too as another little subtle weapon against the food industry and your weight loss quest. So you have to be able to have stress resilience, which means you have to have some omega-3s, good sleep, follow circadian rhythm. You can't rely on these dopamine hits for pleasure, which means you have to have mindfulness awareness and no sugar addiction. And you have to have more executive control. Right now, the food industry is trying to convince everyone that obesity is beautiful, that it's okay. But I know, and you know, that it leads straight to heart attacks, atherosclerosis, dementia, cancer, ICU stays, massive financial hits, bankruptcy, a ton of problems. So excess energy storage is not normal for the human condition and is not beneficial in any way, shape, or form. And we need to fight back against them and get healthy. So consider thermally abused frying oil. OK, restaurants and manufacturers routinely reuse oil over and over and over again. Why? To cut down on costs, right? First, they buy the cheapest oil, then they reuse it. So that's thermally abused. This is in the food science literature. Mice that were given thermally abused frying oil grew breast cancer metastases at a 4x or fourfold rate than mice fed fresh oil or just a low fat diet. This is one of the reasons you should never eat at fast food restaurants, if any restaurant. Uh, they're giving you thermally abused frying oil that's filled with omega-6s and now oxidized to death. And we know it induces more cancer growth in animals. And we know the cancer rates in America, except for a few that are early detected now, have gone up. So I'm just telling you that this food that you think your, or your brain is telling you at once, it doesn't really want. And in addition, reused oil has been shown to have acrolein in it, which we know is carcinogenic. Um, does taking morning fish oil break your fast? Does taking morning fish oil break your fast? If it's straight oil, it should not induce a glycemic response. So your, your body should not have an insulin spike. Um, I will tell you this, that is very controversial in the fasting world. A lot of people get very upset about these things. Personally, I wore a glucose monitor for a month to check all of my theories. And I can tell you, that when I drank coffee in the morning with heavy cream, I never spiked glucose, that's just me. But in theory, a ketogenic diet, you can eat cream all day long, right? And you're still gonna go into ketosis because you're never gonna have that insulin spike because you're never putting more glucose into your system. Um, so I would say if it's pure fish oil, it should not induce glucose. Um, if you have a way to check your glucose, do that when you take fish oil. But the simplest thing to do is just wait until your fast is over and then take your, then take your fish oil. Um, they wanted to go back to the three psychological things to follow. Oh, uh, all right. Just, repeat, just say that they were going to put it up on the screen. All right. Now, I am not a psychologist. I'm just an orthopedic surgeon. But this is my understanding of the literature. Values, clarification, mindfulness, and distress tolerance. So the distress tolerance has to do with what I told you. If you have no stress resilience, you're going to be more prone to emotional eating and have less impulse control. If you're not mindful of what you eat, you will not have a health mindset. You will not have a growth mindset. You will have learned helplessness. And then you have to have the values that you value health, that you value wellness, that you value being able to play with the grandkids, that you value healthy, natural foods that are good for the planet, good for farmers that benefit local communities and aren't benefiting a few large conglomerates that are really just destroying us all. So once you get a value clarification that benefits your health and mindfulness every day when you're preparing food and eating food and you can handle stress and be resilient, you're 80% you're there. All right, so again, work on your self-awareness. Number one thing, develop a growth mindset and accept who you are, but understand and believe that change is possible. Here's a question. I'm so hungry right now, I would eat raw broccoli. Okay, if that's true, and you're so hungry that you would eat raw broccoli and you're not a raw bro broccoli fan, then you are physically hungry and you probably actually are hungry. Go ahead and eat. 
if you say I'm so hungry right now, I'd eat raw broccoli and you have a piece of raw broccoli in front of you and Cheetos and you're going to go for the Cheetos and you're probably not hungry. It's probably emotional eating and you're not really needing the food. So maybe don't eat at that point. Those are the mindfulness things I'm talking about. And it's us against them. They're not going to change. OK, everything about our culture is pro fatty, nasty, disgusting, reused oil food. So they're not going to change. So only you can. That's why I'm giving you these tricks. So be aware that sugar causes a bigger dopamine rush in your brain than cocaine does. OK, understand they want you addicted to it. And most of us are. Be aware that it was engineered for this purpose and you are falling for it. And then there are enormous forces aligned against us being healthy, us being a normal weight and us living a long, happy life that's cancer free. Look around your town. How many cancer pavilions have gone up? Why? Because cancer drugs are massively lucrative. They're counting on this. All messages promote badness. Every commercial, every billboard you drive by, ignore them. Stay off of social media for purposes of weight loss. Okay, that's a whole nother talk we could get into, but social media has not been shown to help in any way, shape or form. And a lot of the apps out there and whatnot have not been that effective. Um, and they basically are trying to use guilt and shame against you, which are negative emotions, which I don't want you to have. And then if you want junk food, don't eat it in secret. Okay, if you feel like you have to have a Snickers bar, enjoy every single mouthful, but be mindful of it while you're doing it. Be mindful. This is really triggering the hedonic pleasure centers in my brain. And I'm really getting a good dopamine hit here. I guarantee you, you do that a few times, you're going to start to say, why am I eating this thing just for a dumb dopamine hit? And you're going to move on in your life. Picture the factory and the abused workers where this food was manufactured. Go watch some of the Netflix documentaries about the food industry. And you're going to really question everything about you. Just start being mindful. Don't trust celebrity endorsements. And I'm thinking don't watch sports because every athlete is sponsored by a fast food company or a soda company. That's, I guess that's it. Oh, no, nope, we got another one. So focus on your health and your brain health. Okay. Don't worry about your weight in and of itself. It, I'm telling you, the weight is a side effect. You got to worry about your mitochondrial health. Exercise for brain health, exercise for longevity, but don't rely on it to lose weight. It's not going to happen. You should lift heavy objects periodically to get your muscle mass up. That will help pull glucose out of your bloodstream. Understand that everything that works in the diet world is really just inducing portion control, okay? Surgery, drugs, whatever. And you can control your own portion control of mindset like we talked about. Time restrict your eating window. Consider keto for uh, initiating weight loss. The ketogenic diet does work to induce weight loss and fairly rapid weight loss, but it's just not sustainable. And after a while, you're just filling yourself full of advanced glycation end products. That's why I'm not a fan of the keto diet over time. But if you need rapid weight loss early, time restricted eating plus a GLP-1 receptor agonist plus a ketogenic diet, you'll drop the weight. And then the Mediterranean lifestyle is by far the best. It's the most sustainable. It's been studied the longest, has the most long-term health benefits. And then fiber, 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 fiber. We didn't talk about fiber today, but you have to have a lot of fiber in your system, both to feed your gut bugs, your gut biome, to slow gastric processing, to reduce glucose absorption. And then fiber, of course, has a whole other host of health benefits. Fiber is one of the biggest problems in America. There's no fiber in any ultra processed foods. If there is, they're adding it later and they're only adding soluble fiber. They're not adding insoluble fiber. So you have to eat your fruits and vegetables. That's why the Mediterranean diet is so good. High fiber. All right. Remember that most Americans eat all day long, at least 15 hours a day, and eat ultra processed foods. 80% of the American diet is ultra processed. If you can't help but become more healthy, if you limit your eating window and then focus on real, actual, natural whole foods that exist in nature. The strict circadian rhythm is a must, in my opinion, which means a solid sleep schedule. You have to sleep or you're never going to lose weight. It has to be good sleep. Consider GLP-1 agonists. I have considered it for my patients and I write them for my patients because I think they are very helpful to a lot of people. As far as supplements are concerned, berberine is an awesome one. This is made from a tree bark. It mimics metformin. It upregulates the AMPK action in the mitochondria. So it's beneficial for your mitochondrial health and it reduces appetite and it reduces blood glucose. Berberine is awesome. And then ALA, which has also been shown to help cellular function and mitochondrial health. It's a very strong antioxidant for your cells. So it helps metabolic dysfunction. It's been shown to reduce appetite and help with glycemic control as well. 
try to stay off of social media because we don't need to be comparing ourselves to other people and relying on guilt and shame to get where we want to be. We want to have positive emotions. What about OTC fiber, like Venom fiber and Captain? OTC fiber, I would just look and make sure it's got um, a certain component of insoluble. Okay. And I don't, I don't know exactly what's in Venom fiber off the top of my head. I did have a GI doctor recommend it was either Metamucil or Benefiber to me uh, for bowel health previously, uh, but you just have to have both insoluble and soluble fiber. Okay, so celery has insoluble fiber, like your body doesn't absorb it, but the gut biome does. Soluble fiber is like um, inulin. Do you recommend? Psyllium, yeah, psyllium is one of the better fiber supplements you can take. Yeah, it has both components and is very beneficial. So yeah, psyllium husk is a good one. How do you get that? They sell, so I've seen psyllium for sale at Whole Foods. All right, I will offer metformin and GLP-1 agonists. Coverage is an issue. And the other problem is some people don't want metformin in their medical record because then when they try to go get disability or life insurance, it looks like they have diabetes. And that's a no-no. So the, that group, berberine, is perfect. Berberine is not covered because it's a supplement and it's good for you. So why would it be covered? Uh, but berberine is a metformin substitute. So start with that for supplement. I have referred people for bariatric surgery. Now I usually start by recommending Winjara or, or Ozembic. If I can't get that covered, I try to do bariatric surgery. If I can't get that covered, then we're right back to square one, right? Um, I usually recommend for people that have to lose a lot of weight, quickly or want to or need to, the time-restricted eating plus ketogenic diet like we talked about. Um, and I just recommend time-restricted eating, not even for weight loss, honestly. I do it for brain health, longevity, cellular health. I'm not doing it for weight loss. I'm doing it because it's just good for you. And then I emphasize sleep. I send people that are obese for sleep studies because you have to get the sleep managed. If you have sleep apnea, it has to be managed. You never lose weight. It's a waste of time. Anything I just talked about, if you have sleep apnea and it's not controlled, that should be your first trip. Uh, Mediterranean diet is the best. We talked about that. And you should exercise, but not to lose weight. It's not going to help you there, but it'll help everything else about your life. And then the supplements we talk about. Berberine, ALA, which is alpha lipoic acid. Acetyl L-carnitine has been shown to help burn fat and get you into that fat burning phase. NMN is a cellular energy component, so it improves the mitochondrial bioenergetics, which makes your cells function better, which makes your insulin function better and everything else function better. Resveratrol we talked about is a longevity molecule. It's fasting mimicking. So it does the same things at the cellular level that the stress of fasting does. Pterostilbene is a bit more bioavailable than resveratrol and also fast mimicking. And we have all of these if you need them for on well theory. Uh, D3, B complex, iron and magnesium, you have to have all of them and they gotta be at sufficient levels. D3 is one that is mandatory in my opinion, as is omega-3. And then turmeric also, not only is it good for arthritis pain, it boosts metabolism. Capsaicin, same thing, good for arthritis pain, boosts metabolism. So spice is actually beneficial for you too. Do you want to talk about probiotics or just? Somebody had a question? What about probiotics? Uh, somebody had a question about probiotics. Yeah, I mean, I think anything you can do to enhance your gut biome health is helpful. I'm not a biggest fan of probiotics. I'm more of a fan of prebiotics, so fiber, um, fermented foods periodically, but just eating a healthy whole grain filled with fruits and vegetables diet, automatically you're um, seeding the gut with good stuff. So prebiotics, I'm more of a fan of. Just like, this is us. Do you have any questions? Oh, if you guys have any questions, shoot them right now and we'll answer them. Otherwise, hopefully this helped you. And it was a lot of uh, technical information, particularly about the brain. Um, in the, you know, the control center and the hypothalamus and the dopamine and all of that. But I think all of it matters. And I think the country as a whole needs to think about these things a bit differently than we have been. Traditionally, all we think about is macronutrients and, you know, cut the calories. But we know that hasn't worked at a societal level. And I think we need more. Direct to the website for the uh, talk. Okay, so the talk is going to be on this website. Will also be on my practice website. Yeah. All right, it'll be on WarnerOrthopedics.com and TheWellTheory.com. And TheWellTheory.com is my line of supplemental products that I have formulated and designed, and is made in America and third-party tested. 
um, all along the lines of reducing oxidative stress, reducing chronic inflammation, promoting brain health, promoting cellular health and mitochondrial function. So you can pretty much find what you need if you're not able to get it fully from your diet, which frankly, most of us aren't because of time and the constraints of the grocery store product offerings. But hopefully this helped somebody out there. Um, and good luck to the people waiting for the total joints. I hope you get the outcomes that you want. And maybe if you lose the weight beforehand, maybe you won't even want the joint, I hope. Um, do we have questions? Oh, we have questions. Okay, I thought we didn't. <laughs> You're delayed to them, so I'll get to that. All right, here comes a couple questions. Is it better to take tart cherry supplement at night or with meds? I mean, with meals. The question is, is it better to take tart cherry supplement at night or with meals? I take it at night because it does naturally have a bit of melatonin in it. And I don't want melatonin in my system during the day because that messes up your circadian rhythm. So I take my tart cherry at night. Um, when's your book come out? My book, good question. Uh, we have it with an agent right now is submitted to some publishers. So we're, we're in that process. I'm thinking within the year um, because obviously it's got to go through some editing and whatnot. And I've got to add some references. It just came out, but I'm thinking by this time next year, it should be out. Uh, could you clarify mitochondria function and weight loss? Okay. The question is, can I clarify mitochondrial function and weight loss? The mitochondria is an organelle inside of your cell that produces ATP. It does a whole other host of functions, but it's a primary um, source of the energy currency for your body. So it makes the ATP from the food. Um, if your mitochondria is not working well, then the rest of your cell cannot work well and you get metabolic dysfunction. So most of our metabolic dysfunction problems are non-communicable diseases are coming from poor function of the mitochondria in whatever tissue type that is. If it's in the brain, you're gonna get neurodegenerative disorders. If it's in the pancreas, you're gonna get insulin resistance. If it's in the gut, you're gonna have all the gut problems like Crohn's and IBD and all that. If you have mitochondrial dysfunction in your immune system, you could get cancer because you can't fight it off, things like that. So mitochondrial dysfunction is the primary driver of our health in general, which is really a whole separate thing from weight loss. Weight loss is weight loss. But unless your mitochondria are functioning well, it's probably gonna be really hard to lose weight because your energetics are all screwed up. Um, do you have it to reduce cholesterol? Have you heard of red yeast rice supplements or is there something that you recommend be better? Uh, somebody's asking to reduce cholesterol. Have you heard of red yeast rice supplements? Yes, and I think that does work well for a lot of people. Um, and then the question was, do I think anything will work better? So cholesterol is interesting. Um, the long-term major studies have sh shown that cholesterol is not as relevant as we think it might be for long-term cardiac health. And I don't want to get anything too controversial here, but I'll give you an example. The studies of people at risk for heart disease that took statins for five years, the ones that took it religiously, never missed a dose, uh, only... a prolong their life by four days uh, from the reductions in LDL cholesterol. So talk to your physician about this, but I think there should be more of a focus on your mitochondria health and things like that than the cholesterol numbers per se. Now, some people have genetic predisposition, familial hypercholesterolemia is one uh, to massively high cholesterol. In those cases, you do need to control it with drugs and supplements. Um, but I would say the best way to control it is to eat a high omega-3 low trans fat diet uh, first of all, and a lot of fiber. Fiber has been shown to reduce cholesterol probably better than most drugs. Um, so that's psyllium husk, somebody else mentioned. Um, and then just be mindful when you think something's fiber filled, just make sure that it's got, you know, a good carbohydrate to fiber ratio um, and make sure you're getting both soluble and insoluble. But I think adding a lot of fiber to your diet will probably be as effective as most drugs. And then if you're taking red yeast on top of that, it's probably a great thing. Um, but if you're on a statin out there, don't go off the statin just because I said that. Go talk to your doctor. Or maybe add fiber to your diet, and then maybe you'll be able to reduce your statin over time. And then CoQ10 reduces the muscle pain that is often associated with statins, if you are on a statin for cholesterol. Um, last one, I think. How is my... Oh, how is it tested to see if that's one pro one's problem? 
what mitochondrial function? Oh, good question. How do you get your mitochondrial function tested? Or how do you test for mitochondrial dysfunction? There's no great test. That's the problem. Nobody's really looked at it. Um, this is all stuff that's been coming out more and more recently. Uh, you can check sometimes your oxidant levels in certain tests or your antioxidant levels. But by and large, the way you know if you have good, healthy mitochondrial is if you don't have metabolic dysfunction. So if you're in that 10% of Americans that don't have metabolic dysfunction, you probably have decent mitochondrial health. And then what, what do you have to do? What supplements do you have to take to get good mitochondrial function? Oh, yeah, the supplements that really help the mitochondria is the ALA because it's a lipid and water soluble antioxidant that's been shown to improve mitochondrial um, function in basic science lab studies. And then NMN, which increases your levels of NAD, which is the electron transporting molecule between the glucose and the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle in the electron transport chain. Uh, omega threes, because they make the cell membrane function much more better, much more better. They make the cell membrane function better and make it more flexible and the receptors work better and the mitochondria work better with a, with a higher level of omega three to omega six. And also you have less um, inflammation with an omega three heavy system. Uh, resveratrol we know helps. That's a longevity hormone. CoQ10 is probably one that we should all take. Uh, CoQ10 is, it, it actually moves electrons from one of the cytochromes to the next in the electron transport chain. And it's one of the strongest antioxidants. Also melatonin is a very strong antioxidant, but, but melatonin, you can only take at night and you don't need to take that much of it. And everybody's different with melatonin. So you kind of have to check your own dose, but CoQ10, uh, ALA, NMN, resveratrol, quercetin, Berberine, because it upregulates the AMPK, which is beneficial for mitochondrial health. Those, those are ones I would recommend along with D3 and um, omega-3s. So it sounds like a lot, but stacking is pretty common. Yeah, that sounds like a lot, but um, you'll find as you get more and more into the wellness world, a lot of people do stack. They do take a lot of different things for different reasons, or they cycle, like they'll take berberine for two months, then they'll take... Um, ALA and CoQ10 for two months or whatever. So there's a lot of different ways to approach this. Um, and remember, you know, a lot of people tell me, well, supplements are so expensive and they're not covered. That's true. If your physician writes a prescription for a given condition, a lot of times you can get an HSA health savings account or a flex spend account to pay for it. Uh, but what I look at is the amount, it, it's an investment in my brain and in my health because I don't want to spend a minute in an ICU intensive care unit. I don't want to go to an emergency department I, I don't like going to the physician's office and I am a physician. So to me, investing in my health and wellness and empowering myself will hopefully keep me just running and jumping my whole life and happy as a clam and stay out of those very financially devastating health situations. Okay, she says last question. All right, last question. How do you test for metabolic dysfunction to know you have it? Uh, how do you test for metabolic dysfunction to know that you have it? So the hallmarks are high blood pressure, um, high triglyceride levels, certain total cholesterol, which is your ratio. So total cholesterol to HDL ratio, your waist circumference, and then, um, your fasting glucose level. So those things. So you want your fasting glucose ideally to be, I mean, an ideal world, it would be 70, but under hundred, the waist circumference we already talked about, you can either use a two to one height to waist ratio, or women should be about 30 inches and men 35. Uh, you want your triglycerides. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but in the hundreds, low hundreds, uh, you want your total cholesterol to HDL ratio. I want to say it should be four or less, um, but I'll have to fact check that. But these are the different basic. And then the BP needs to be normal, which is currently, I think, still 120 over 80. Um, and if you really want to get fancy, you could check your, fans, your fasting insulin, but that's not a standard test that people check. Uh, those are the basic test for metabolic dysfunction. If you have three out of those five, you have metabolic dysfunction. All right. Well, I think that's it. Uh, if anybody has any other questions or any comments to make, feel free to send them. And again, you can share this talk with people. Um, and hopefully it's somewhat helpful. And if you guys want to hear more about any particular aspect of this talk, let us know and we can maybe delve a bit deeper. Okay. Everybody have a great day.